All right, hello and welcome to E-Rate, what's new for 2021. I am Krista Porter, the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, one of my duties as Library Development Director is I am also the State E-Rate Coordinator for Public Libraries. That means I provide all of the training, education, uh, consulting, hand-holding, uh, whatever our public libraries need to get through successfully through the E-Rate process. I've been doing this since uh, 2009, so a little over 10 years, so hopefully I have um, gathered up uh, enough uh, experience and knowledge to help uh, make sure you, you um, get through all of this. Uh, in today's webinar, we are going to go through the basics of the E-Rate program and, and the details of submitting some of the forms, how you do things. Um, so we're going to dive in pretty deep to some of the forms, which will be very helpful to people. Um, I know some of you may have done E-Rate for a long time, for years and years, and that's great. Uh, it's always good to have a refresher. Uh, to remind yourself about how the program works. Um, but some of you may be brand new to the E-Rate program, and that's great too. You will learn everything you need to know, hopefully, to get started with the upcoming year. So let's get to it. So what is E-Rate? E-Rate is a federal program that gives discounts to schools and libraries on their internet services. Um, this would be your monthly internet costs and any equipment or construction needed to make that internet work in your library building. Uh, this is the wording here from the E-Rate Program's own website. Um, it's a federal program to ensure that schools and libraries can obtain high-speed internet access and telecommunications at affordable rates and keep students and library patrons connected to broadband by providing a discount on eligible services. So it gets you a um, discount on anything related to getting internet to your library. The money for this program comes from the universal service fee. This is a fee that we all pay into, uh, customers like us. Um, if you look on your phone bill, your internet bill, your cell phone bill, you will see along with all those taxes and fees that you pay, something there that may actually say universal service fee. It might be abbreviated to USF. It uh, doesn't usually say E-rate, um, but um, something like that, it's a federal fee. Um, we pay into it, and the telecommunication companies themselves pay into it as well. So we are the ones that provide the funding to help the schools and libraries um, be able to afford their internet connections. The E-rate program is run out of the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission. They oversee the program, they do the orders and rules and set all the policies. And when the program was first set up, it was set up via the uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996. And through that act, they created the Universal Service Administrative Company, the not-for-profit that actually runs the program. Um, they, they are the ones that we work with um, daily to um, do the forms and approve all the applications and, and provide the funding. They also do, there are also other programs that they give discounts to there in addition to E-Rate. E-Rate is um, the one for schools and libraries and the schools and libraries division is a subset of USAC that handles, the, that runs that for us. But they also do a uh, program to give discounts to healthcare facilities, um, people in high cost areas and people with low income. So there's a lot of things that USAC is doing. Um, we're only focused on you know, talk about the E-rate one, E generally being the abbreviation for education. Uh, throughout this uh, workshop, and when we usually talk about E-rate and um, dealing with them, um, we'll be referring to USAC because they are the ones who send you the emails, reach out to you, who you talk to about everything. So if USAC has emailed you, USAC needs this information. The E-rate funding um, runs on a funding year. Whenever you are applying for E-Rate, you are looking to the future. So you, you are saying um, right now you are able to apply for receiving funding for funding year 2021, which starts next year. And the funding years always run from July 1st of a year through June 30th of the next year. So uh, this is not a program where you can buy something and then go and, um, after, and after the fact go and say, okay, I bought this thing or I have this internet, give me, a, I would like a refund or a, a discount on it. You've got to think to the future. So things you've already paid for cannot be done with E-Rate, it's things you're going to be paying for. Um, and right now the pro it is open for starting your application for the fund 2021 funding year, so that's what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, there is almost $4 billion available in this pot of money that we all put into, so there is a lot of money out there for everyone to use. Um, 
unless you make some major mistakes on your applications, almost everybody um, be, is approved for what they're asking for. Um, sometimes there are tweaks depending on if things are eligible or aren't eligible and, and things need to be done. But um, there is a lot of funding out there for our schools and libraries. So who is eligible? Who can apply for this? Uh, the FCC rules for E-rate state that anyone, any library that is going um, to apply must be eligible for LSTA funds. That's Library Service and Technology Act funds. And who is eligible is determined by the state library in each state in the country. So here in Nebraska, it's us. The Nebraska Library Commission is your state library. Um, here we have determined that we, we provide a lot of services to you, um, programs, uh, databases and things that use LSTA funding. And since you guys use those services, you are then eligible to receive LSTA funded service. So um, our determination is that all public libraries are eligible for E-rate because of that. Uh, also, our schools and school districts, same deal, they are eligible as well. And if we had consortia, groups um, that get together to save money on, on services, you can um, have a consortia application. Um, as I said at the beginning, I am the state E-rate coordinator for public libraries. Our schools and school districts, they have um, staff on hand at the Nebraska Department of Education that help them with their E-rate applications. Um, there's some, some things, sometimes things are a little differently the way schools do it than libraries. So I handle just libraries and we'll be talking about that today. <clears throat> So the first thing I tell libraries when they are going to are considering doing E-rate is let's find out how much of a discount you can get. Uh, the E-rate program uh, is a ongoing program. You have to apply for it every year. It's not just a one shot thing and then you always have it. You have to reapply every funding year. Um, and there are multiple forms throughout the year that you do have to submit. Um, I am here to help you make sure you do that, but it's good to know how much money could we potentially be saving before we get into this. Uh, it, can def it can help you to uh, talk to your board or your municipality or anyone in the community or on your staff who might be concerned about why are we spending so much time doing this and dealing with this program. You can tell them right here um, why, before you even start submitting forms, why this would, could be a good thing for your library. <clears throat> So you can receive anywhere from 20 to 90% off on your eligible services. This would be um, your monthly internet and um, any equipment needed to run that internet. The discount percentage is based on the National School Lunch Program. This is the free and reduced lunches that the children get in the school district where your library is. Uh, now, you this is this was picked by the FCC as a it's one of the many ways to determine levels of poverty. They needed to figure out who, how much of a discount should we give, give, place, give schools and libraries. We'd like to give more of a discount to the needier areas. And there are many different things that can be indicators of poverty. They just decided to go with this one, the school lunch numbers. Uh, if there are the more kids that, that are eligible, the more needy the families in that area that would be, would be, and the more needy that particular community is and would need a higher, um, would like a higher discount. Um, this is now you may serve uh, children or and people from other school districts because of where you're physically you're geographically located you might be on the border of a school districts of multiple ones or just people travel because of where you are um, and that's fine if you serve other school districts but for e-rate purposes for calculating this discount you just look for wherever your library is physically located what school district are you sitting in and those are the numbers that you look at um, in addition, it is only K through 12, uh, pre-K numbers have to be removed from the calculation. Generally, that doesn't make a huge difference in the numbers, but officially. Uh, in addition to that, then you look to see whether you're considered urban or rural. Uh, and this is based on U.S. Census data. In Nebraska, most of us are rural, so that's good because we get a slightly higher discount. Um, urban would be mainly our uh, larger cities. So how do you find out these numbers? Luckily for us, the Nebraska Department of Education posts on their website every year the uh, school lunch numbers. So you can go to their website and um, don't worry about trying to not jot down any of these URLs I have in the presentation. Um, they're in uh, in the slides. The you have the presentation. It's on the website. Um, it's been sent to you and it's on our E-rate website that I have uh, as well at the Library Commission page. So we have links to everything. But on the Department of Education website, they have a lot of different spreadsheets, but they have one that's for the national school lunch data. And when you go into there, there's one page is every single school in the state. 
and showing what their numbers is. It shows how many children are, el are enrolled in the school district, how many are eligible for the school lunch program, and then what percentage that is. Um, and something, oh, I should mention too, the, the key to this too is this is the number of students that are eligible for the program, not necessarily, not, not the ones who actually apply. That number can be different in many areas. Um, sometimes some families just don't need it. They're actually, yes, we are officially uh, technically eligible, but we really don't need it. We're doing fine. Uh, some, some families choose not to apply due to the stigma of it. So um, that's a very important differentiation there to know. It's not just the number that have actually applied, it's the ones that are eligible. Um, this also goes into, in some schools, they, in some areas, they were concerned about privacy, that if you know who, you're gonna know who the children are that actually are in this program, no. We don't know who they are, we don't know who they've applied, because that's even not what we're looking at. It's just a number. Out of this many students who enrolled in the school district, this many are eligible. We don't know anything more than that. <clears throat> so you can find that on the school department education website. In that spreadsheet, like I said, there is a one sheet that is every single school, but they've also added a sheet that is the school districts as a whole. So you don't have to go and look up each individual school and then do the math to add them up. If you have an elementary, middle school, high school in your district, um, you just go to the district one, find your school district, and it gives you the percentage. Then USAC has on their website a lookup tool for finding out what your urban or rural status is. As I said, this is based on census data. The most recent census, well, it's based on the 2010 census right now. Um, we just did the 2020 census, so at some point it will be updated to those numbers, but that all needs to be tabulated, and so we got ways till that changes. Uh, the cutoff between urban and rural is 25,000. So if you're 25,000 or more is your population, you're urban, and less than 25,000, you are rural. And then you look at USEC's discount matrix to figure out your discount. And that's this here. So you can see here the percentage of students that are eligible for the school lunch program and then what the discounts would be. Now there is category one and category two you'll see on here, and I'll get into the details of that. That's just different types of services you can receive an E-rate discount on. Excuse me. And you can see, even if half the children in your school district or less have are eligible, you can still receive 60 or 70% discount on your internet services. So on your monthly internet bills, or on if you need uh, if you need to buy any new equipment <clears throat> to run the internet within your building. So this is a very good deal for many libraries. There's a lot of things that we're going to take into consideration here to decide to do it, of course, but uh, definitely a benefit. Most of our libraries in Nebraska do fall between the 60 to 80 percent discount rate. I think our average is 72 or 73 percent, something like that. So this is what you can take then to your community or your board or your municipality and say, if I do this, if I devote time and energy to doing this, we can save 70%, 80% off on our internet bills. <clears throat> so what can you get a dis discount on? Uh, we're going to talk about the eligible services list. <clears throat> what is e-rateable? Um, e-rateable, I don't know if that's a word, but I use it for this. <laughs> Um, every year, the FCC publishes a new eligible services list, the ESL. It is posted on their website, and we have links to that on our page as well. Um, because there's a new funding year every year, there is a new eligible services list every year. So uh, when you are doing E-rate, if you're looking at a, um, applying for next year, or if you're checking out what you did this year or a previous year, just make sure you look at the appropriate <coughs> eligible services list for that year, because things do change. They do update it, they do add new technologies, tweak things on there um, as things change over time. And it is broken up into two different categories. Category one, services providing the high-speed connectivity to your building, getting the internet to your library building. And then category two is making that internet service work throughout your building inside. And I put together this graphic here to help illustrate that. That uh, brick there, that's the walls of the wall of your library building. So category one is just bringing your internet connection, whatever it is, to uh, the building's walls. So getting it from your service provider to your building. Once you get it to your building, you then need to have to make it work. And you need all this equipment, modem, routers, racks, switches, cables, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that's category two, all of that equipment that can make it work. 
<clears throat> what's not eligible is the actual devices you you, you um, go on to use the internet service. So um, a laptop, your smartphone, tablet, PCs, any wireless devices or print, anything that connects to the internet service. So purchasing those devices themselves is not part of E-Rate. E-Rate is all about the service, the internet service and getting that to your building and making it work with the, inside your building. So onto some specifics about each of the categories. Category one is basically anything that gets high speed broadband to your building. So it could be DSL, cable modem, broadband, ethernet, uh, wireless. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the most common ones. The eligible services list has all the potential ways it can get it. But basically anything that can get an internet um, connection to your building. A little bit more information about fiber. Fiber is something that does need a little more explanation and we have some extra um, options for that as well. Uh, lit fiber, because there's lit and dark fiber. Lit fiber is fiber that's out there, fiber optic connections that you can contact a service provider and connect to and then you just sign up and you're using it. Dark fiber is uh, fiber optic connections that are out there that have not actually been turned on yet and aren't available to use. Uh, when the fiber was installed in many communities and they were digging the trenches and laying in the cables and everything, fiber optics, they put in more connections than was needed at the time, knowing that there's gonna be future demand for this. There's gonna be an increase in demand and let's be ready so we don't have to do all this construction and digging all these um, trenches again. So they put an extra and it's in there just waiting to be used. Uh, somebody owns it, not you know, aren't always sure who, and has the and somebody has the ability to then turn that on and use it. So you can do an e-rate application request. I'd like to get fiber. I'm looking for whatever's out there available lit, but I'm also interested in if there's any dark that might just need to be turned on that I can connect into. And when you are doing your e-rate application, there's a uh, note here about that you will apply for both dark and lit together at the same time so that you can cover all your bases for that. And I'll show you exactly how that works when we get into looking at the forms themselves. <clears throat> Related to fiber is special construction. Special construction is an E-rate category. This is um, under uh, category one. This is uh, getting the, the new fiber connection to your library building. So if you don't have fiber at all right now, you're using something else, broadband, cable modem, modem wireless, whatever, and you, and you want to get fiber, you can get a discount on the construction of bringing that fiber to your library building. So there may be fiber lines somewhere in your community, but it's like across the street is where they stopped installing it or a few blocks away or just outside town or wherever. And that last bit of connection, sometimes called last mile, that is con called special construction in the E-rate world. And you can receive your E-rate discount on any of that work that's done. The planning of it, the management, the design, having the guys come in and connect and extend the connection to your building. Um, all of that um, is eligible for E-rate discount as well. Now, USAC knows that not every, these companies cannot necessarily do all of this construction, <coughs> excuse me, um, just within an E-rate funding year, that July through June time frame. they might need to do it at other times. And you also want to make sure you have this construction done so when the funding year does start, you've got the service ready to go on July 1st. So this construction can actually happen anytime six months before a funding year begins. So going back to January of a year. So for example, you would like to get fiber for next year. Uh, you wanna make sure you're, it's ready to be used and to receive your discount on July 1st as the start of the funding year. So you have the construction done anytime between January um, and June. Yeah, so at any of those times. And then that construction, even though it's outside of the funding year before it, because it's related to receiving that fiber, you receive a discount on all of that work and construction as well. <clears throat> Now, also related to special construction, uh, when E-Rate did a little um, streamline and modernization of their program back in 2014, 2016, they added this new state matching fund as an extra um, feature of special construction. If a state puts up money to help libraries complete this work, E-Rate will match the money that the state is putting up. So um, 
um, a, a library gets a special construction done, they, they want to have this done, they want to have the fiber run to their uh, schools and libraries, and the state says, great, we'll put aside some money as well to um, add a little bit to your funding. So you know, their discount will be this much, but we'll pay for some of the extra that you're responsible for. If, you tell, if, we, if the state tells E-rate that, then E-rate will match the state funding as well, so you can get even more of a discount um, of E-rate and the state helping to pay for that extra bit of the costs uh, that you would need to cover. Um, and it's actually it's better explained with actually math. <laughs> so, um, and these numbers, I just made up these numbers for ease of math. I don't know if these are accurate for what these would cost, but it explains the special construction and state matching fund concept. So you're, you've uh, received a bid from a company who will do this construction, will put new fiber, and that's key too. This is a new fiber line run to your library. This is not about upgrading current fiber to a faster speed or um, anything like that. This is just brand new for the first time. But you have a bid from a provider to do this, and it will cost $100,000, and your E-rate discount is 80%. So um, E-rate covers $80,000 of that $100,000, because that's um, how much is discounted off your cost, and the library is responsible for that extra $20,000. However, this state has a matching fund that they have set up, and they say in our matching fund, we will contribute 10% of whatever your project is. And in this case, because it's nice, simple math, that's $10,000. And because the state has that matching fund, E-rate says, great, good for you, we'll match what the state is giving you too, and we'll give another 10%, $10,000. And in this perfect math example, the library in the municipality's cost is zero. Everything is covered by E-rate or by the state themselves, um, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> so um, very simplified, $100,000 project. Your E-rate discount is 80%. E-rate covers 80,000. The state says, we'll, we'll spend, uh, we'll cover up to 10,000. Take off another 10,000. E-rate says, good on you. We'll take, we'll match that. Library has to pay nothing. So um, this is, uh, a great deal. Now, of course, if your E-rate discount is less than 80%, this is like the perfect math, it, you will have to pay a little bit of something at the library, at, from the library of the municipality. Um, and it also depends on, you know, the cost of your project and everything and what's 10%. So depending on your discount, you'll have to do something, but you'll still get another 20% off on whatever your discount is because of having a state match and then E-rate matching the state's um, funding. Now, why do I explain all of this in such detail? because we have this now in Nebraska. Uh, about 20, 25 other states across the country have gradually been doing this since they made it um, um, a, uh, a part of the E-rate program, the state matching fund over the last four year, five years. And finally now this year, the um, Nebraska has um, done it. Uh, this came out of the Rural Broadband Task Force. This was a group of people that was over the last through three years or so, have been investigating um, the internet situation, the internet broadband situation in the state of Nebraska, and has just last fall put a proposal, put, um, submitted their report to the governor's office for what they think could be done. Now, this is all about all sorts of internet in the state, not just for schools and libraries. So it was about ag and, and business and residential and healthcare, et cetera. So there's lots and lots of parts of this report. But the one small part that has to do with schools and libraries is related to this universal service fund um, and this extra funding. Um, I mentioned at the very beginning of this that there's the universal, the national, the federal universal service fund. In Nebraska, we also have our own, which is run by the Nebraska Public Service Commission. So here in Nebraska, people also pay a little fee to create this fund um, that is used to help our local just in, in Nebraska get even extra discounts on their services uh, but from this funding and out of the uh, report the recommendations from the report <clears throat> the Public Service Commission has set aside one million dollars to use over the next four years to help libraries and schools do this new fiber construction using this the special construction feature in the e-rate program and then matching that pro that funding with their one million dollars this is starting this year, uh, which is great. We are very, very close to the, to the deadline of being able to get uh, in under in the under the wire for this for this year. So this might not be something you're ready to do right in, right now because you would have to you know jump on it like today, tomorrow, get your application in, get everything put out. But that's okay. I'm going to explain it to you now. Um, and this is something like I said, it's available for the next four years. So if you're not ready to jump on it this year, that's fine. You can do it for next year or the year after or the year after that. 
So you do have to go through the E-rate process. You do the first form in the process, which is your 470, where you're saying, hey, I would like have to have a company um, do this special construction for me and, and run the fiber to my library. And then you go through your competitive bidding process. There's, and then you pick who you're gonna um, go with for the company. The competitive bidding process for E-rate, once you submit your first form, and we're gonna get into a lot more detail about this later, but just as a general overview, once you submit your first form, you have to wait 28 days to allow everyone who might contact you to reach out to you, and then you can make your choice. So if you submitted a form today, you wouldn't be able to make a decision until 28 days from today, which is uh, later in December. And the reason this is getting cutting it close is once you apply for E-rate, then you have to apply for the Public Service Commission's matching funds through the state. And their deadline, their deadline is a little wishy-washy. It doesn't, there's not a specific date on the order about this. Um, it is, uh, they've just said mid-December. And we've asked for specifics and they've decided they'd rather make it a little, uh, let it float a little, I guess. Uh, the specific order is NUSF 117. If you have wanted to look this up through the Public Service Commission, Nebraska Universal Service Fund 117 is the order and the application. Um, you'd have to get that in by mid-December. Uh, elsewhere in the application, they suggested that they would do it, they would have the deadline be the last day in December, but nothing was really a fish made official, so we're kind of floating around here in the last half of December being needing this form in. So you'd need to do your 470, uh, pick who you're gonna go, wait for your 28 days for competitive bidding to happen, if there is any competition, Go pick who you're going to go with and then submit the Public Service Commission's application. Uh, to do your 470 and, and to submit all this, you also have to have a RFP, a request for proposal, which is a much larger document um, that you fill in about the details of how this construction could, would need to be done for your building. Um, here at the Library Commission, we do have a template for that, that we are providing to libraries, where you just fill in your libraries in your community's personal info. Um, Holly Wolt, who is on the computer team here at the Commission, is the person who's working with, um, who I'm working with on this whole program. We're doing it together. And she's the one who would, you would reach out to if you do want to get a copy of that template to see what you would need to put in there. But that needs to be submitted also with your 470. So there's quite a bit of work to do with this. With the deadline to submit to apply for the Public Service Commission funding being mid to late December, we're really cutting it close right now. If you're ready to jump on it, you can try. Um, all that could happen is maybe you miss the deadline and just have to wait till next year. We'll see. Um, whenever whoever has applied, we do have some libraries who have applied for this already. So um, we do have four or five libraries, I think that are gonna be our tests. They're the first ones to go through this process. So we do have some that we're working with right now to make sure how this all works for the first time through. Um, sometime in mid-January, the Public Service Commission would uh, will be evaluating your, your applications to them and then would let you know if it has been approved for the matching funding. And then you would do the second form in the process, the 471, where you then tell USAC, we've, uh, we applied for E-rate and we've picked we want to be our service provider and we have this state matching funds. There'll be a letter that you'll attach to that 471 saying letting E-rate and USAC know that so that they know to match that state funding so that that all works out in the end. So definitely something to look into if you are needing new fiber run to your library, look into special construction and um, in general, and then also look into um, the state matching funds that we have available. But like I said, right now, really kind of close to the deadline. You could try and get in if you're able to. If not, don't worry. This money is a million dollars available for the next four years, so we can try next year. But do reach out to me or Holly Woltz here at the Library Commission if you want to know a lot more about that. So that is our Category 1. Any questions about Category 1? You can type into your questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. <clears throat> All right, on to category two. So category two, as you remember, is everything inside your library building. So any equipment or service that's needed to make the internet connection that you've brought to your building to make it work. Um, in addition, so as uh, you see here, um, you've got a network closet maybe somewhere or somewhere in a corner where you've got all of your 
wires coming in and racks of, of switches and routers and things, all of that equipment. So your cable, your firewalls, routers, ratch, bleh, racks, wireless access points, power supplies, um, any software needed to run the network um, and upgraded, upgrades and things like that. So all of that that has to do with making your internet network work within your library building is eligible. In addition to the ma basic maintenance of these connections, so we don't just give you money to get the equipment, but you've got to upkeep, do the upkeep on it as well. So if it needs to be repaired, if anything needs to be replaced, um, basic service um, system updates that are, need to be regularly done, security, et cetera, et cetera. So anything to keep those connections working. Now, a basic maintenance is only, you only receive a discount on actual work that has been done. So, for example, you may have a contract with someone, it could be your service provider may do this for you, and that's great, um, but it may be a tech person in town that you know, a, co a local company that does this kind of work, and if you have a contract with them to be on call, so to speak, for that, and you pay them for example, $20 a month to be on call, but they don't need to do anything until like the fourth month of the year because that's when an upgrade is needed or that's when a squirrel got in the walls and chewed up the cabling and needs to be replaced. Then that actual job, that work that they need to do to replace that cabling and do the update, um, that work is what's eligible for a discount, but not the $20 you spent per month just to keep them on call. So if you have to pay something to have the contract, that money's not, it's just where they actually have to come and do something. <clears throat> um, in addition, there are some things that will be um, either on category one or two, um, all of your taxes, your surcharges and fees. Um, make sure you let you include that in your cost calculation when you're telling USAC how much something's going to cost. Don't just say my monthly internet bill is $30 but say it's $30 and it's these taxes and fees onto that $30. All of those taxes are also eligible. Um, any training your staff might need to do to make sure they know how to work the internet, work the network, your network, and installation, configuration, um, any of that that needs to be done. Um, so pay attention to everything that's related to your internet, that those things you mentioned when you were asking for a discount. Now, it can be um, confusing to understand what all this is. What are all those wires and cables in that closet there or underneath that desk? I don't know what connects to what. Um, and we're not all IT people. I only know, even myself, a little bit of the basics of it. Um, but there is this great resource that's available out there that actually Holly Wolt here and others um, Nebraska staff were partially involved with getting out there. The Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. Uh, this is designed, as it says, for our small rural and tribal libraries who don't have their own IT department. Many of our libraries, there is not an IT person on staff. You depend on the person in town who happens to know a lot about the internet or who helps you connect things. Um, but it's good for you as a library director or the person in charge of your library to know and understand what is actually going on. Don't just say, oh, they'll know it and they'll take care of it. I don't know. You should learn about this and understand at least the basics. And this toolkit can help you do that. It is free. It is available online. We have a link to it from our E-Rate website. It was funded by a grant from the IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and they just recently got an update to that grant, actually to um, a new grant uh, to update it. So it is constantly being um, refreshed. But it has questions that it asks you about what is, what is in your closet, what is the model numbers, what are the things that you have here, so you can learn about how it all works and how it all connects. And then it also will provide you with a plan to improve it if you need to and increase that speed if you need to. So it could say, you have this kind of router, you could get this one and do better and have it increase your speed. Um, or you need to update this, this is too old. So it's a really good resource. We highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, look online, download the document, go to your network closet. And if you do have someone who helps you with your IT, ask them to come in and look over it with you and then it help them explain and fill in all the all the blanks on this document for you. <clears throat> so that is our category one and category two services that are available for e-rate discounts. Do you have any other any questions right now now that I've gone through the category two services? All right, let's go on 
let's go on to our category two budgets. Category one and category two funding um, are both they're both calculated and, and provided to the libraries a little differently. Category one is pretty cut and dry and basic. You pay this much a month for your internet disconnection, you receive this percentage off as a discount. Um, you, um, it, so it's, a pre, it's very simple, it is what it is. Category two is a little different. Uh, what, is, what USAC has done with category two is they create what they call budgets for this, a category two budgets. Uh, a, a pot of, uh, it's a calculation for an amount of money that they are willing to give you to pay for any of your category two services, all those, the equipment and the installation of all of that. Um, the wording I find is a little, misleading i might say um it's not a budget it's not like a traditional budget that you have where they say here's money we're just going to give it to you now go and spend it it's more of just a calculation of how much money you could use and it's over the next five years it's, it's got a it's got a uh, a lifespan of five years um and we'll show an example of this and as so you can see the math of it so they have five-year budgets where they say, we think you could spend this much money over five years to uh, upgrade any of your category two equipment. The five-year um, budgets go from starting next year is the beginning of a new five-year cycle, 2021 to 2025. Then it'll, you'll get a new budget for 2026 to 2030, et cetera. Uh, this was done as a pilot project over the last six years, actually. They started this out as a test to see would this budgeting work for libraries and then uh, they did it as a five-year one and then added an extra year made it kind of six years to just wor work out iron out all the details so it is we've been uh, testing it out for a while and they decided this is a, a work a way to do it it is working for libraries uh, at the beginning of your five-year cycle your budget is set and it is not adjusted for inflation any time throughout that five years so you get an amount at the beginning in 2021 that you can use over the next five years and you can use it however you want over those years. You can use it if you've got, if you know you've got a new big uh, computer lab upgrade coming or a new library building being built, you can spend it all in that first year to get everything done and then just do nothing category two for the next four years and then wait till the next five year cycle to begin. Or you can spread it out and use it gradually throughout those five years. The first year you could buy some new cabling for the library the computer lab. The next year you can buy some routers and then the next year some switches and wireless access points. Um, it's up to you how you want to use it and how you want to spread it out. <clears throat> now if you have a project that costs more than what your budget is, so for example that's okay too. You're just only going to get an E-rate discount on how much the, the E-rate has, has uh, calculated that you're eligible for. So for example, you have a project to upgrade your computer lab and it costs uh, $50,000, but your E-rate budget is only $25,000. That's okay. You can still do that big project. You are not you are not now limited in saying, well, we can't do the project because E-rate only says we have 25. All they're saying is we will just give you up to 25,000. You can have a project that's way above that for all you want, but we're only going to give you a discount um, up to half of that project <clears throat> because it costs 50,000 and your budget is 25. So just you know, just think about that. Um, you're not cut off because your project's bigger. E-rate is just going to only look at part of it to give you a discount on. <clears throat> So how much is this budget? How is this calculated? Uh, for libraries, this is based on the size of your library building, the total area and square feet of your library. So all the floors, everything inside and wherever the library space, whatever the library space that is occupied. So you may know this number, which would be great. You might have to look at blueprints or ask somebody in the city or someone about your building, but you just need to find out what is the total area and square feet of the entire building, all floors, everything. And then that for this 2021 through 2025 funding year is multiplied by $4.50. That's the, they call the multiplier <coughs> that they've determined for this funding, this five-year cycle. The next five-year cycle, it could be different. Um, previous cycles, when we were doing the pilot project, it was all different ones each year as well. Uh, the minimum, but with a minimum budget of $25,000. So if you're, um, library is pretty small and your calculation comes out less than 25, you still, everybody gets 25,000 as a minimum budget to start with, um, no matter what. Now, if you'd heard about category two and had working with this in the last few years when they're doing the pilot, the minimum budget was different. Uh, the first uh, five years, it was 9,000 something was a minimum. And then last year for 2020, they upped it to 
11, 12,000. Uh, they realized after going through this process that libraries really did need more of a minimum budget. And now they've said, bumped it way up from <laughs> to 25,000. Everybody has that as a minimum. So um, by going through this process, they learned uh, what it really should be. Um, this can be changed. Your your calculation could change every year if the size of your library changes. So you have to change the, your square feet. Uh, hopefully, maybe going up if you're expanding or building a new building that's larger. But even if it goes down because you had to um, cut back on space or move into a different location that's smaller, your calculation would go down too. So using real math to show this and explain it, uh, your library is 3,500 square feet. Yeah. Um, 3,500 times 450 is 15,750 for your budget. However, there's the $25,000 minimum. So since your calculation came out less, your actual budget is 25,000. Now, this is your pre-discount budget, meaning just like when you purchase something on category one where it costs this much, but you only get the discount percentage off, you've got to take that pre-discount budget and take off the discount that your um, that you your library has. So in this example, just for nice math purposes, the discount rate is 50%. So the library will actually receive half of that 25,000 in money to spend. So $12,500 in funds to spend on category two services over the next five years. So you now have that much money to spend. Now within the E-rate system, everything E-rate is done in an online, there's an online system to apply for all the um, funding, to do all your forms and track all of that. And they will keep track of this for you in that e your E-rate account online. So uh, they will do the math and figure out, you know, you'll tell them what is the square feet, then the system will do the math and say, okay, here's your budget amount. And then if you do apply for category two funding, it will deduct from that each year and let you know how much you have left for the future year. So it'll keep track of that for you. <clears throat> So category one and two are both a little different as far as the math is done and how you get the funding, um, but you still use the same forms to apply for both of them. They just work different behind the scenes to figure it out. Um, category two can be a little confusing, but I found for myself doing this math really helped me figure out, oh, okay, once I get all, the, all of it done, I just have this much money to spend. Great. <laughs> I'm good to go. And then I just know to keep track of that. So any questions about category one, category two, how the funding is done, category two budgets, type into your questions section. And if you do have any questions as I'm going, you don't have to wait for me to ask. If you think of something you're confused about or something pops into your mind that you wanted to know more about, go ahead and type it in and I will answer it uh, whenever you ask. So one other thing that you do have to think about when you are applying for E-rate is SIPA and filtering. SIPA being the Children's Internet Protection Act. Uh, this is the act that requires that anyone who receives uh, federal funding for internet services must be filtering the internet that comes into that um, location. So this is for your internet access, you receive the actual internet service, that category one, or the actual, you are getting funding for the internal connections, purchasing all those equipment pieces in category two, or having any of that construction done to make it work. All of that, if you want to receive an E-Rate discount, you do need to be in compliance with SIPA. Uh, SIPA is about having a filter on your computers to block access for, um, to block minors access to, um, unsavory things on the internet, your pornography, violence, whatever it is that your community thinks they should not be looking at. Uh, this is something that can be a uh, controversial in some areas, uh, and it varies in different by community, um, and each community can decide how they want to be in compliance with SIPA and how they want to, what they want to be filtering. There are some people that think blocking access is absolutely necessary. We have to protect the children at all costs. So put a filter on all these kids' computers and make sure they can't get to anything bad. Um, all the way up to the other extreme end of the spectrum where some people uh, consider filtering to be censorship and that it's blocking intellectual freedom and blocking people's ability to get to anything that they should be able to have freely have access to on the internet. Um, and all the sorts of opinions all the way in between. What's great about SIPA, though, is 
for our E-rate purposes, it is very vaguely written. There's not a lot of detail to it. So we can work with SIPA um, and get these filters in our computers so that we can receive these E-rate discounts and not really impose on people's use of the internet and what they can actually access and get to. Um, SIPA, the document itself, is only 12, 14 pages long, depending on how you print it out. Uh, so you're welcome to read through it if you want to. We have links to it on our website, too. Um, it does not state a huge list of here's all the websites you must block. It does not say you have to block YouTube or you have to block Facebook or whatever. It talks about what the content is and what's out there. Um, it also does not say here's a list of the filters you must use. It does not dictate these are the only acceptable um, services or internet filters or software that you must use and install. You can do use whatever you want that's out there. It just means it says you have to have one. So uh, there's a lot of leeway there for you to work around that. Um, there's also one feature of uh, one uh, section of it that is very important, I think. It does also state that for any adults, which is 17 and over, according to SIPA, that want, are um, wanting to access something on the internet for bona fide research, that is something that is legal, you do have to turn off the filter for them. You have to have that ability. So uh, there is the ability to make the internet completely free and open to anyone who needs to. But you've installed the filter, so you are in compliance with SIPA. Turning off the filter for people is also part of filter SIPA being compliance. And by doing that, you are um, totally following the rules and you are eligible for any federal funding, including E-rate. Um, so that's something I think it's very important to remember is that you have to have that ability. Uh, something else about it is it does require, however, that you must have the filters on all of the library's computers, all the computers the library owns. Uh, so this would be not just your children's computers, which that is what the act is all about, is protecting minors, but you do have to install these filters on every computer in your building that connects to the internet. So both the children's computers, adult computers, and staff computers. Um, also any devices that you hand out that are owned by the library if you lend out laptops those as well would have to have them on there. Now, for these adult computers or your staff computers, as I just explained, you have to install them on there, but then you can turn it off. So if you decide for adult computers, we just don't filter anything, I'll get it installed and then turn it off, good. For staff computers, you might have staff that need to access things and they need to get out there and not have anything blocking them. In the back room, if you have a computer or your circulation desk, just do the installation and then turn it off and you are good to go. Um, our technology protection measures right now are not very bright, <laughs> as I'd say. Uh, so there will be things that they will block that they shouldn't. For example, breast cancer research uh, sites it might be blocked because it uses the word breast, if that's what something in your, in your filter thinks is a bad word. So there's going to be situations where you will have to turn it off. Um, if someone does ask you to turn it off, they don't have to explain why. They just have to say, I'm an adult. This is blocking something I need to get to. As long as it's a legal site, something legal, you can just go ahead and do it. No questions asked. Now, the other things specifically that SIPA requires is just three things. The, an internet safety policy, and this is something you may already have. This is a policy that states uh, how people can use your internet and your computers at your library. Uh, please don't go any to any illegal sites. Uh, don't hack our computers, please. Don't do anything bad to them, that kind of thing. You might already have that in one of your uh, library policies, like how usage policies for the library. Uh, then the technology protection measure itself, that's the filter. Um, itself. Now the filter itself can be software you install on each individual workstation. It can be something that's on your at the server side, so uh, your internet server um, or router that then sends the internet out to all your computers, it can be there. Uh, your service provider might provide it at their end, outside the library, and then you've got it covered from that way. So there's all sorts of options for that. Uh, we don't recommend any particular service here at the Commission, there's just too many variables at each library to, to um, us to be able to decide. But we have links on our website to information about filters and options that are out there so you can make your own decision. And then the third thing you need to be in compliance is to have had a public notice or meeting and hearing about it. Now this doesn't have to be a huge meeting and announcement of we are going to be filtering and everyone come and talk about it in the community, <clears throat> unless you need to, I don't want to. It could just be 
an agenda item on uh, a library board meeting saying, hey, we've decided to do this. Uh, here's the, we're going to have an open discussion about this in a board meeting. Anyone who's um, in the community who wants to can come and talk about it to us. Uh, you may have done this before. If when you did first install a filter years ago and decided to do it, it was discussed at a board meeting so that they could approve that you're going to be purchasing this and installing it, that counts. You don't have to redo this meeting or something if you're now suddenly deciding to do E-rate. There is information on the USAC website about SIPA, information on our website, so um, you can read more up more about it. Uh, but basically, you are required to be in compliance to get E-rate, but there are ways to do it that will not impose on your users too much, and they would not even notice necessarily that you even have a filter on there. Um, the filtering level that you decide is whether it's high level, maybe for the children's computers, less for the adults, turned off completely for your staff. That's all a local community decision. Um, you just have to have it there to begin with. So any questions about SIPA? That's my quickie little explanation of all that. So let's talk about the E-rate forms themselves. As I said, this E-rate is a uh, process you have to go through every year, and there are multiple forms to submit throughout the year as you go through it. There are uh, basically four different four steps in the E-rate process and four forms that would need to be submitted for every application. The first three forms here, and we're going to get into a lot more detail about all of these, so this is just a general overview here. We're going to get into a lot more um, specifics in the second half of the workshop today. But the first three forms here, everybody has to do, with a few slight um, exceptions. But 470, 471, 486, everybody does. The last form called the invoicing um, 474 or 472, that depends on how you're going to be receiving your E-rate discount. Um, if uh, you're going to su submit the form to get the money back or is your service provider going to submit a form to get the money re reimbursed to them. So your first form is the 470 where you were just announcing, I would like someone to provide a service to me, whether it's my monthly internet, I want to buy some equipment. The 471 is I've picked who I want my provider to be and what I'm going to buy. The third form is letting USAC know the service has actually started. I've, I'm receiving the equipment and I would like my reimbursement. And then the fourth step is I'm paying my bills. Give me my money. <laughs> I'm ready to get my money. Uh, if you are receiving a discount on your monthly bills via your service provider, they're just sending you a reduced bill to start with. They submit a for, what's called the 474 to USAC to be reimbursed for what they've discounted you. Service provider always gets paid, paid in full. Part comes from you, part comes from USAC. So if you're getting discounts, you're done with your E-rate process at the 486. However, if they don't discount your bills, or if it's something you have to just pay in full ahead of time, then you have to submit a form, the 472, which is called the BEAR, the uh, reimbursement form, to get that money back after you've paid your bills in full. And in that case, you would have to do a fourth form in your E-rate process. After the year is over, generally, at the end, you then see you've paid everything in full, and now you want it to be reimbursed from USAC. If you are doing that reimbursement afterwards, you have another form you have to submit, but only once, not every year. These other these forms, the other ones you do every year. The 498 is to provide USAC with your banking information for the bank account you want this funding deposited into, the library's bank account. They do direct deposits of this as your reimbursements now. They don't send it, mail a check or anything to anyone. It's just an uh, electronic payment. So you have, have to let them know what is the bank account information. So you'd have to do the 498 first, and then you can submit your bare forms to get your reimbursements. So um, the 498 is only done once, not every year. Um, as long as your banking information doesn't change, you do that once, and then it just lasts for the whole years and years as you're doing your regular forms for the E-rate process. <clears throat> and like I said, we're going to get into a lot more detail about all these forms. This is just a little overview right now. There is also a, a document retention policy related to E-rate. You must keep copies of any of your E-rate paperwork for 10 years after the last date of service. Last date of service is the end of a funding year, which is June 30th of whatever funding year it is. So for example, for the funding for the E-rate year we're applying for right now, which is 2021, 10 years from the end of that is June 30th, 2032 
which sounds way, way long time from now. But so for anything having to do with 2021, you need to keep all of that for 10 years. Uh, if there are any things that you used previously but relate to the current year, you have to keep them as well. So for example, you may just pay month to month your monthly internet bills. You don't sign a new contract every year, every three years. And um, that was originally set up back in 2010. That contract you still have to keep a copy of with your 2021 paperwork because it relates to that money, that, that account that you have. So you're gonna have to make copies of that and keep it like in the same file for 2021 that you hold on to for 10 years. Um, SIPA, you would keep that forever as well because from whenever you first started filtering, that's going to apply for every year going forward. So all that documentation about when you first did it or an invoice or proof that we have it set up, copies should go into the, into the same file that has to do with that every funding year. Now, what's great about this is you do not have to keep paper copies, unlike this scary picture of piles and piles of papers that I have here. Uh, you can keep it in paper if you want, but you don't have to keep big file cabinets full of this or binders on your, on your shelf full of this. You can keep this all electronically. Um, and especially now that we have to keep 10 years worth, highly recommend scanning everything and saving it to somewhere um, on your hard drive, uh, a special flash drive that's just E-Rate um, in a folder. For, you know, each Give each year a folder on your, on your computer for um, you know, E-Rate 2021, E-Rate 2020, E-Rate 2022, whatever, um, so that you can keep everything in there. Um, the, the key is that if USAC does come and ask you about any of these things and in any particular year, you can just jump to that particular file and find the document that they need to give to them. <clears throat> and the reason they have this document retention, retention policy of 10 years is because they can go back now 10 years if they want to um, and do what they call an audit and check up and see how your application process went. Now, this is not an audit like the IRS does, so I don't want you to, you know, don't don't panic about that. Some people do. Um, it's not because you've done something wrong necessarily. It's more of a checks and balances type thing that they do. They need to, they like to make sure the program is working. Is the process successful? Are people doing things in the right order? Did they understand what to do at each step? All of that. Um, and is everybody keeping the right documentation? Do they know what they're supposed to do? So don't panic if they do reach out to you to do one of these things. <clears throat> it's just generally a check thing but they can go back 10 years to do this. Now, this just became a rule with um, the updates in 2016. So right now we don't actually have, we're not 10 years past when it became a rule. So gradually we will have 10 years. Um, if you didn't keep things back 10 years from now, because the previous rule was only five years, that's okay. <laughs> um, you don't have to suddenly find things that are you know, 10 years old from now. Um, but gradually we will have to have um, everything. And the things you do need to have is basically anything related to your E-rate service. So of course, all the forms you submitted, all of the responses back from USAC, um, any other correspondence from them with questions or anything. Now, as I mentioned, E-rate does have an online portal, an online location where you do all of this work, which we're gonna see in just a second here. And they have said they will for you, keep everything for 10 years within that online account, and that's great. But it doesn't hurt, I think, to play it safe and have your own copies locally as well. Um, for all the forms you do, you can um, download and print out PDFs and keep your own versions of everything if you need, if you want. Uh, because if when they come to ask you for a piece of documentation, you might not be able to get into your E-rate account, your internet might be down, uh, it, you know, there might be issues, you never know, technology, doesn't always work. It's always good to have a backup of all of these things. Um, also, anything else related to what you did? Did you sign any contracts? Were there any invoices for equipment that you purchased? Um, the, any discussions you had with service providers about what they would be providing? Um, if you had to make a decision, if there was a comp competitive bidding process and you did have to have competition and make a choice, how did you make that choice? All of this stuff you do have to keep. Now, a lot of these things might not normally be with you, uh, contracts or invoices, um, your, your city clerk or whoever does your accounting may have those, but get copies for yourself as well for E-rate purposes. Uh, rather than having to track down 
your clerk and ask for this invoice from five years ago and who knows if they can find it. Um, have your own duplicates of all of this. You don't have to have the original, but at least make copies of everything that relates to your E-rate and keep it in your own files somewhere so that if you set, because they're going to come to you and ask for this information and you're going to be responsible as the one who submitted the application <coughs> to get them the, um, the piece of the document that they need. <coughs> All right, so that's our document retention policy. Just checking my time here. Perfect. So the E-Rate program, all of your forms and everything are submitted through uh, the E-Rate portal, EPIC. Uh, EPIC is the E-Rate Productivity Central, Center, <laughs> E-Rate Productivity Center. Uh, EPC is the acronym, but it's pronounced EPIC. So whenever you're submitting anything, that's what you um, are going into. It is a uh, one-stop shopping for anything you need to do E-Rate. You can complete all your forms in there. You can check your status. You can communicate with USAC. Um, PIA is their Program Integrity Assurance people. They're the ones that might ask you questions. Um, anything you need to do is all in that one account. And there is um, the URL. You go to the main USAC website, usac.org slash E-Rate to get to it. Uh, one important tip right now, uh, this past summer, uh, USAC did institute multi-factor authentication. Uh, this is something where it's now a two-step process to log into the e -rate, your E-Rate Epic account. Uh, you have to log in, you have to put in a, your username and password, which is standard, <coughs> excuse me, but then you also have to follow up with, they will send you a verification code, um, a little six-digit number that you then also have to enter. It's an extra level of security um, to make things safer for everyone. Um, if you've used other kind of online services or things, you may have done this before. Uh, sometimes it's a, uh, something that is sent to your phone, a code that is sent there that you then get and use in your online account. Um, this one, it will email you the code, so you have to, you have to check your email account to do this. Uh, so it takes two steps now to log in. At the moment, we have discovered that this new multi-factor authentication is only working successfully on Chrome or Firefox browsers. Uh, previously, Epic worked everywhere. You could be using IE or Safari or whatever, anything you liked. Um, but now that they did this uh, authentication right now, we're only sure that it works for Chrome and Firefox. I've helped a quite a few libraries in the last month or so who had previously used uh, specifically actually um, Safari and it worked just fine and it just gets you caught in a loop and it doesn't actually get you logged in. It just keeps asking over and over again for this verification. Something's just not programmed correctly there. So for now, just use Chrome or Firefox. If that changes in the future, we'll try and let you know. <laughs> So to log in to your Epic account, um, every library has been sent up, um, has been set up with an organizational account in there, and USAC has picked someone to be the account administrator, the person in charge of the whole account. Uh, when they first did this back in 2016, it was based on whoever was the contact person that submitted the second form in the E-rate process, the 471. That's one where you've picked, here's who I'm going to go with for my provider. Uh, if you did not get one set up, you, didn't, you weren't doing E-Rate before, that's okay. You can just call USAC. Their, uh, their customer service is called their Client Service Bureau. And in the, later on in our slides and on their website, we have an 800 number for them. You can reach out to them and request a um, account be set up for your library. Um, or if they do have one for your library, for you as the director or the person in charge to then be the account administrator to run that account. So you just have to reach out to them if you don't already have one. Um, account administrators can also add other people to the E-Rate account if you have other staff that you want to help you with doing E-Rate or someone else in your staff that you want to hand off E-Rate to do and put them in charge of. You can add other users to the account and then give them certain abilities, certain permissions. Um, they can be a full user where they can do everything, submit, uh, fill out the forms, submit them, certify them, do all the official things. They can do be a partial user where they can enter the information in the form, but then you or someone else who's um, authorized can actually do the submitting of the form. And there's also view only access where they can just look at everything but can't submit anything. Um, and then everybody can also update and fix, if necessary, the organizational info. That's the basic info about the library. So now we're going to get into some screenshots to show you how this all works on the USAC website. So like I said, you go to usac.org/erate. 
eHyphen Ray. And this is the uh, login, the main screen, the main page for the USAC website. And there's two blue buttons, both that say sign in. Either one of them works to log you into your Epic account. They're just in two different places there. Uh, when you click on them, you'll first get this long explanation of how to log into one portal. This is their new, um, uh, the new way of logging in using that multi-factor authentication with that extra verification security. Now, the first time you log in, and only the first time you log in to this new version, so um, you have to do um, these eight steps here, which involves resetting your password, so changing your password, logging in, doing the verification to get yourself set up the first time. So if you have not logged into your e account since summer, they instituted this in um, June, July, of um, 2020. If you have not logged in since then, you're going to have to do this setup the first time. After you do this once with re forgetting your password, um, saying you forgot your password, re changing your password and logging in, that's only you have, only have to do that the first time. Every other time you just skip all those that part with the, your password and just click continue and then log in using the username and password that you created. Um, it is a little misleading because you know if you don't read every single word here and they don't I, I don't think they highlight it as much as they should that's why I circled it here the first time you sign in is the only time you have to do this I've had quite a few people get caught up in doing this every single time they log in changing their password every day when they log in no you only do that the first time then you just ignore all that um, one through eight there and just go ahead and log in with what you've set up but so the first time though you will come here you will click the continue button down here at the bottom and then it will give you the screen to enter a username and password but since this is your first time using this new version you've got to pretend you forgot what your password is even if you have no what it is just pretend you don't so you click the forgot password link there and then it will ask you to enter your username to send an e reset email uh, in epic your username is your email address it's not a, it's not anything else that you set up it's just whatever your email address is um, this is similar if you've forgotten your password or need to reset a password in any online system it sends you an email that um, with a link in it sends you an email with a link in it that you use to reset your password so you'll enter your email there hit the click the reset via email button they'll send you an email and then you will follow that email link change your password your password, they do have some requirements for security purposes for the password. It has to be at least eight characters long, have one lowercase, one uppercase, one number, and one special character. So you do have to be creative with it. So you'll give yourself a new password, use that password to log in. Then you will have it send you an email to with a verification code. This is that second level of the new second level of security. You'll enter that verification code, and then you'll be able to log into the system. Um, the second part here of sending the verification code, that's something new you'll do every time you log in now. The first part of re-changing your password, that's only the first time you go into the system, not every single time. So after you've done that password, reset password, like I said, just don't, don't read all that, you're all good. <laughs> just click continue and then enter your username and the password you created. Check the box to accept the terms and conditions and sign in. It will then say, we now require multi-factor authentication. This is that second step. And it already has pre-filled in your email address. So you just click the send email button for them to send it to you. The screen will reset and give you a box to enter the passcode. So this is something that's gonna have been emailed to you. So you will then have to go and check your email, whatever email account you use for E-Rate. And you receive this kind of a, an email. It's called, it says one-time verification code in the subject line. Whoops, back up. And then here is your six-digit code that you can enter. This code is only valid for a limited amount of time. This is not your code for every time you log in. It's only valid for 10, only will work for 10 minutes. And then it will expire and no longer be good. So what I've been doing is as soon as I use this particular code and this particular email to log in, I go right back to my email account and delete this email because I don't want to get confused the next time I log in and they send me a new one-time verification code and accidentally click on the wrong one because then if I try to enter this code here and it's longer than 10 minutes 
from when I received it, it won't work anymore and I'll get an error message. So this is a very limited time thing. Every time you log in to E-Rate, into the Epic system, you're gonna have a new verification code that, you have, that you'll be sent and that you enter. So I'm gonna take this code that I did get and I type it into the passcode here. If you didn't get the email, check your, uh, very often people, it's going in, for people, it's going into your junk mail or um, your spam folder. Your spam folders are junk folders in your email account, so check there. Um, if you still can't find it, you can have them resend it. But once you do have it, enter the code, hit verify, and then you're logged in. When you first get to log in, you may have this kind of screen where you can get into um, the Epic system itself, or you can submit your bear form, that reimbursement form that I mentioned earlier, and we'll get into doing that in a, a bit here. Um, the bear form is done in kind of a separate special system, a special place. <laughs> But we're going to go just right into Epic and look at some of the um, basics of your account here in Epic. Now, yes, now I know you can't read this whole screen. That's okay. I just want to show you when you first log in, you've got this long screen um, that has all the information, all the different things you can do in your Epic account. This is your applicant landing page. Um, it says welcome in your library's name here. And then it has um, different things you can search for and a whole bunch of menu items up here in the upper right. And we're going to go through some of these um, now. I'm going to zoom into some of these parts. Uh, the first thing to know is here right in the middle, I'm going to zoom in, is under the My Entities section. This is information about your library. And you have an entity number that has been assigned to you. Uh, this is also called the Build Entity Number or BEN, B-E-N number. Uh, this is uh, a number that is associated to the library for the whole time that the library works with E-Rate. Uh, multiple staff may come and go um, working uh, at your library and doing E-Rate, but this number will always be associated to the library. It's kind of like a social security number for a person that follows you for your whole life. This is the build entity number for the library that follows it for its whole life in E-Rate. Uh, this is something that you do need to know for your library. Very often, um, EPIC or E-Rate, uh, USAC will contact you, will ask you questions, and they will want to know your build entity number. Or when you are submitting a question to them or sending something to them, you're going to need to enter this number. So you're going to make sure you know this. But it's right there on your main login screen, um, applicant landing page for you to um, look it up. At the very bottom of the page here is this, um, also a very important thing to use, your FCC forms and post-commitment requests search. This is where you can look up any form that you have submitted in the E-Rate program, as long as we've had EPIC, which goes back to 2016. So I very often get questions from libraries saying, I can't remember if I did this form. Can you tell, I don't know if they received this form. Um, if, I, if it's successfully gone through, can you find out for me? You can look this up yourself. You just go into your account and you go down there, you choose the form you're looking for and you choose the funding year that you're looking, you want to look at. So an example here, there you can choose, you can look at your 470, 471s, 486s, uh, form 500 is a, a different form, we won't talk about that one today. Um, and then you choose a funding year. So here I've said for four, for 470s, what have I done for 2021? I'm trying to remember. And once you enter those two, you um, your results pop up down here and you can see on the right is the status of these forms. If it says certified, that means your form has been submitted, um, USAC has received it and you are good to go, you've done that form. If there's anything else um, like incomplete or any other statuses, then it, you have not finished it and you still need to go in and complete that form and work on it. So in this case, I did do a 470 and sent it in, and I had started another one. Um, maybe I'd gotten confused or backed out of it and started a fresh one. That happens. So this is where you can check all of your forms and make sure what they've we've received, and you can see if you need to do a particular form. Uh, up here on the top of your screen, there is a blue bar with some uh, other sections of your Epic account you can go to. I'm going to talk about a couple of them here. There's a news section, which sounds very good. It actually is uh, news, uh, notifications, letters, um, con contact with different libraries for the entire E-Rate program. E-Rate is a public program. All of this is something that any, you, know, you can see what everybody else is doing and they can see you know, what you've applied for. So if you go there and click on that, you're gonna get news for every single library. But you most likely wanna know yours. You wanna know your, you only really wanna know your library's news. So instead of using that, what you want to do is at the top of your landing page, underneath the USAC logo, it says welcome and your library's name. 
you click on your library's name and then you get into your library's account. We've got lots of different things you can do. Customer service, you can submit a, a, a question to USAC. Uh, I mentioned the category two budget, that's here in, a, in the middle. This is where it does track what you have in your budget, you know, how much, what you, based on your um, square footage and how much money you have left, so that's where you can check that. But you can also click here to get news, and this is just the news items related to your library, not everybody's. So if you go in here, you'll see this is um, my library's, the 470 was submitted from my library, and it's right there for you. So that's where you should go to look up at news, because it will only be about your own library. Uh, the second option up here is tasks. This is, and if there's a number here, you have got something in there. Tasks are forms that you are in, are things you're in the middle of doing. You started a form and haven't completed it yet. Um, you're waiting to certify something. So this is all stuff that you have insti instigated, instigated is a bad word, <laughs> you have started and are still working on. Uh, for some of these, that may be fine. You, it, what's great about the um, Epic system is it does save as you go. So if you start a form and then um, get called away, as could happen, or you realize, oh wait, I need to look up some more information about this service, I don't remember, so I have to step away and come back to it later. It saves up to where you filled everything out and then you can jump back in right where you left off. And these forms are kept in your tasks section. So if you do start a form and it immediately goes in here, when you go back to it, go to your tasks to find the one you wanna do. You do not click on the top of your menu here and click the form again, to start, that will start a whole new one. And you don't wanna do that. Uh, sometimes though, you may have started a form here and then actually restarted a brand new because you had done something wrong or you weren't sure about what you're doing and you just start all over and that's okay. However, anything you have floating around in here, uh, the Epic system will proactively send you emails to remind you and nudge you, don't forget you've gotta work on this form. Don't forget that you, you need to do this. Now the wording in here can be confusing when you do get those emails, because as you can see, it says create FCC form 471, create, which sounds like it's telling you you need to create one. What it's saying really is you're in the middle of creating one, you already started it. The system will send you emails to your personal email account, however, that say things that says something like this. New task, create FCC Form 471. This task was assigned to you on whatever date. Which gives people, many people the impression it's been assigned to me, so I guess USAC is telling me I need to do this form. I haven't done it. Uh-oh, I better go do it. That's not what it really means, and I wish they could change the wording where it says, hey, you started this form. Do you still want to continue? Go here if you want to do that because that's what this really means. It's, hey, we're just letting you know this is still out there, book, book. Um, make sure you do this. Um, you're welcome to just ignore that email if you know, yeah, yeah, I know I've got to get back to it later, or if you know that you've done it, but you can clear up these so you stop getting these emails. Um, if you go into your tasks, and we'll see when we look at an actual form here, you can discard all of these in-process ones. If you're sure you're not going to be working on it anymore, if you're sure it was just a mistake, or you actually used, you had already submitted the form, and this one, this duplicate doesn't need to be done, you can go in and there's a button to discard form, and then you can clean this up and stop getting those email reminders that keep coming to you over and over again. So. Keep an eye on that. If you get these emails, you're going to have to decide, oh, yes, you have to remember, oh, I am in the middle of something, or no, that was when I didn't need. Let me go and delete that so they stop nagging me. Now, back to your landing page. Uh, you have user information up here in the upper right. There is a silhouette, a little head silhouette. If you click on that, it will bring up a link to go to your own profile. Click on profile. And this has a uh, Right here comes right up in the front that says, here's a button where you can edit your profile. However, there is a big error message down here in red, or error, a, a instruction that says, please don't use that. Please use the manage Epic user profile button in the upper right. Use that instead. Um, this E-rate system is a work in progress sometimes and they don't always aren't able to program out certain things. Um, you can still click on edit profile here, but it just won't do anything. There's nothing to actually, it doesn't work. Um, they've got this new button, which has more robust information there. So you click on here to get into your own user information. And this is where you can change anything about you as the particular user logged in right now using the um, library account. Uh, 
So your name, phone number, um, address, all of that basic information. Now, uh, your username you'll see and your email are not fields that you can edit. You can Once you have set up an account in Epic, your email address becomes your username and it is locked down. You cannot change that. So if your email address does change, I'm going to show you a way how you can make that change in here. Um, if in many library situations, if you are an old director is leaving and a new director is coming in, if you're going to be using the same email address, so for some libraries, their email address for the director is, you know, so and so public library at gmail.com, and it's just a generic library account, that's fine. You can just go in here as the user and change the name of the person to the new director's name. Um, if they have a new phone number, you know, we change that too. Since your email address is staying the same, that's okay. You just change this this particular user account to the new library director's name. However, if it's uh, you have a different email address, if your emails are done, for, you know, for, for example, by your name, like mine is krista.porter at nebraska.gov, I would have to do um, create a new account for the new person and then hand over the administrator control to them. And I'll show you how to do that in a bit here. Now. Sometimes there is not a good transition time where the old director and the new director are working together and there's a handover of this and that's okay. Uh, if, um, if the old director at least leaves you the login information for the E-Rate account and you have access to the email account, you can just you go in as, as them and then change the name to yourself if you're using the same email address. If you need something set up because the old director left and kind of took that email account with them and you no longer have access to it, you can call E-Rate's customer service, explain the situation, it happens all the time, say, I'm the new director at this library, I do not have the previous login information to the E-Rate Epic account, can you please set me up? And they'll set you up with an account to be able, a user account to get in there. Now, up here in the upper right, you can also manage all the users in this account. This is where you can create new ones. You would check your library's name and then uh, create a new user. Uh, this may seem a little confusing here that it says existing organizations and you have to select yourself and you're the only one. Um, the EPIC system, you know, E-Rate, there are many large library systems with multiple branches or school districts with multiple locations. And they would on here have a list of every branch or a list of each um, school location. And we'd have to pick for each location who the people are associated with it. Here in Nebraska, most of our, most of our libraries are just single independent. So you're the only entity and that's okay. <laughs> you just got to pick yourself. So you can create a new user if you're putting in a new person or you can add or remove previous ones and work on their user permissions. So for example, if you need to um, add the new director in because they have a different email address, this is what you would do. You create a new user for them. Uh, and now in this case, you put in for, for the first time their name, um, title, phone number, enter whatever their email address is, the library's name. Down at the bottom is the user permissions. If you zoom in on that, this is what I talked about earlier. You can give someone the full partial view only rights for everything. Uh, something to be aware of is the 498. That's that form for giving the banking information. There's a choice here. You need to be made the school or library official to have the full access to be able to provide that information. So you may have to make this change. By default, that is not given to everyone, so you would have to go in here and make that change. Um, luckily, you can change your own user permissions too as the account administrator and uh, fix that so you can give the banking information if you need to. Now, to change the account administrator, um, and this would be in a case of, like I was saying, if a previous direct, old director and new director have different email addresses, this is how you'd have to do it. You would go in and create a new user account for the new person with a new email address. Then you go into your library's account um, section. This is where from the main landing page, you click where it says welcome and your library's name. You know, we looked at the news item and everything, but also across the top, there's all these other options. If you click this three dots button here, and the poll down menu opens up and there's a modify account administrator option. So you can transfer account administrator from the old director to the new. What you will have here is a list of all your users you might have um, and who the old one is and the new one is. Now, this is another thing that I'll point out to you here that I encountered. 
Um, as I said, your email address is locked in and it cannot be changed. So your username cannot be changed. This means if you get married and change your name and your email address changes because of that, like happened to me a couple of years ago, you can keep using your old account if you want to, or you might, you're gonna need to create a new account under your new email address and then transfer it over. This is what I had to do. Um, at some point, my old email address will possibly stop working because that's no longer my valid name or one. My one now is Krista.Porter. So you may need to do this, but this gives you an example too of, of when I had to do it for this purpose of just transferring it from anyone to someone um, new. So when you get into here, you'll see it be whoever the current account administrator is, and you just check the box to change it to who the new one is going to be. So I'm changing it from me as Krista Burns to me as Krista Porter. You may be changing it from the old director to the new director. Hit continue, and it's going to confirm this is the current account administrator. The new one will be this, and you submit. And now that's all switched over, and now the new person has got all full account administrator uh, powers. Something else you also want to change is the general contact. It's a whole second section of here that has the same kind of contact info where this is the previous person and you want to change it to the new person. This is just who USAC will be reaching out to with any questions they have. You want to make sure this has got the right name as well, name and email address. So it's just like the account administrator. You just check the other box, hit continue. It says here's the current one, here it's who's going, it's going to be changed to, and you submit. So that is some things you can do with a user account and what you can um, might need to change around in there, depending on your situation. If you have any questions or it's any weird or you're not sure, let me know and I can also help you go through all that. Now, there is also um, a certain time of year when uh, USAC opens up what they call the administrative window where you can change things in your profile. At certain times of year, your, your, your organization profile is locked down and the numbers cannot be changed. Once you're getting into doing your forms, the 471, we can't have things being changed in the middle of the process because that can mess everything up. So they make it so you can't change things like the school lunch numbers or your um, square footage of your library. That has to be locked down at some point so that all the math can be done and the forms in process. Uh, luckily for us right now, uh, they just opened up this administrative window in October. So you can go in and make any fixes and updates to your account. So I recommend you go in right now, double check your library info, double check your personal info, and make sure everything is up to date and correct. It will close sometime before the um, time to submit your 471. Uh, the second form in the process, the 471 is only open during a limited time amount of time every year, about three months, usually in the spring, January through March. <clears throat> and right before that happens, that's when everything needs to be locked down by. So by then, sometime in January, they're going to announce the window is being closed for making these fixes. So um, get in right now and get that done. So let's look at your organization information here. Um, we're a little after 11 o'clock. As I said, it was going to take a break. We did start a little late um, from our start time. So I'm going to get through everything here about your organization, and then we will take a break. just want to let you know. So from your landing page, there's a manage organizations option at the top, just like the manage users. You choose your library and click the manage organization button. And now, yes, this is a long page. You can't read right on the screen right now, and that's okay. I'm going to zoom into each part. But I just want to show you, this is a long page that has all the information about your library. So if we zoom into the top, this is the library name, address, uh, basic info. You can change any of this. Uh, we do have some libraries whose names have changed. If your library has become so-and-so memorial library, something like that, this is where you can update all that. If your library moves, change the email or change the address. Uh, latitude and longitude, you do not need anything in there. They considered using that for urban rural status, but decided to go with the census data, so those are all blank. Uh, your urban or rural status is here. Uh, you can, if your mailing address is the same as the physical address, you could put that here. If it's different, you can change that. If you want to add a phone number as needed, if you want to add another email address, website for the library, all this other th information you can update. And then the next section down, you want to make sure all of this is correct for your library. This is very important. Uh, your library type, are you a public or private library? You can see some of these do have blue asterisks, means they're required. 
Um, and then what all these subparts are for your library. Are you um, a research library, a tribal? Do you have a bookmobile or a separate location kiosk? Uh, whatever applies to you, you can check here. Always want to make sure also that you have main branch selected. Uh, for library systems that do have a main branch and then branches, that would make sense, picking one as the main and the other all not. For most of our independent individual libraries here in Nebraska, you're only one library, but you are also the main branch. As far as being the only library, you are the main branch. As far as E-rate's concerned, you want to make sure you have yourself selected there. Um, over on the right here, this is where you put in the library square footage as well. You can see this is also a required field. Um, Right now, you definitely want to make sure you put that in so that if you do decide to do um, Category 2, they can do your calculation for you. Um, USAC is asking that every library, everyone go in and get this correct right now so that when this new, um, the new funding year, 2021, the new five-year budget for 2021 is calculated, we have all the numbers correctly. That's going to be calculated when the window closes based on what you put in here. So even if you're not thinking about doing it next, right in the upcoming year, You've got five years to use that budget. Get this updated right now so that for whatever future time in the next five years, your calculation is all done. Uh, these other fields here are blank because you don't need to use them. Uh, next is your school district. They may have your school district already selected. What this remember, this is based, this is for determining your discount rate, the school district that your library is physically located in. Make sure it's correct. If it's not, you can search for school districts down here. Um, there's multiple ways to search. I recommend zip code. Most likely you and your school district have the same zip code. It's the simplest thing to look up and you know it. Um, you, if you look it up by zip code and do hit search, it will tell you who the school district is and you can select it if you need to. And the last thing here you need is an FCC registration number. This is something new that USAC is requiring. It is going to be needed when you do your forms. Um, anyone who does works with the FCC has one of these numbers. Um, your library might have one and you don't, don't know it. We had one for the commission when I, would have, I applied for RE rate. I didn't know it was what it was. Um, but we do have on, um, on our MIE rate website for you, I do have a link to look up what your registration number is and then to apply for one as well. All done online, only takes a couple of minutes and you'll have a number that you can enter in there. So check your organization account, make sure all of this information is in there. And if anything is not, look it up, look up your square footage, look up your FCC registration number, go in and confirm that everything is correct here. And when, if you made any changes, there's a blue submit button at the bottom here. All right, so that is all the basics of the program. Uh, does anybody have any questions right now that you want to ask about anything we've done so far? Type into your question section. Um, we are going to take a break now, about a 10-minute break, as I said, and then when we come back, we're going to work on the actual forms themselves. I'm going to take you step-by-step -step, um, screenshots of doing a 470 and looking at all the other forms in the process. So do you have any questions right now that you want to ask at me of me before we do take our break? I'll give you a few minutes to type in. I can't see if you're typing, so I need to wait until the question pops up. So let me know if you have any questions. Ah, Jerry asks, how do you discard a task? Actually, I'm gonna show you how to do that when we look at a form. Um, there is a, um, a discard form button uh, when you go and look at a particular task. And when we um, actually look at our 470, I will show you exactly where that button is so you know how, to, um, you, how you can do that. Um, to actually do it, you just go into a task, you know, click on that task, and it will open it up as if you're going to work on the form, and there's a button in the lower left that says discard form, and you click there on that form to do that. But I'll show you exactly how that looks in the 470 that we do, okay? So the first form in the E-rate process is the form 470, and this is the form where you are telling potential service providers, this is what all the services that you're looking to receive an E-rate discount on. Um, do you want monthly internet? Uh, do you want to buy some equipment? All those different things. And oh, there we go. So you are going to describe and request the services you're looking for. This does officially open a competitive bidding process. process. <clears throat> and we'll get into the details of what that means. You are, um, like I said, announcing to any potential service providers publicly that you want to receive E-rate on um, particular services. Your um, 470, I always describe it as, is like a wish list. 
What are the things you would like to get? Um, and it's okay if you put things in here that are things that you might not ever end up going for or being able to purchase, but that's okay. This is just your, we're thinking about these things. The second form is where you say we've decided on these particular things. Um, also, you can um, just put out a 470 to um, feel the waters, see what the kind of responses you might get back for costs when you get bid responses or quotes from particular companies to see how much something will cost. Maybe just investigating to see, is this something I can afford at all? Uh, what would they be offering us uh, via this E-rate process? Um, so you can feel things out. If you decide after you receive bids about or quotes from companies on your 470 that it was none of it was anything you want to go for, and you just can't even do the E-rate process, that's fine. You can just stop and not do the second form, not do the 471, not continue through for uh, the rest of the e-rate process for the year that's okay so this can just be your feeling the waters uh, feeling out there to see what's going on see what you're going to get bids on and uh, dream of what you could possibly get a discount on um, everybody does a 470 to start off the year it is available right now it actually goes live on the summer before the funding year starts so this has been available since this summer to apply for the 2021 funding year which starts next summer <clears throat> There are a couple of situations where you do not have to do the 470. Um, if you are in the middle of a multi-year contract, you do not want to do a new 470. This would be a specific contract where you start, you have a, like a uh, beginning and end date of the amount of time that you have the service. So you signed a specifically a three-year contract with a company for your internet and it started in uh, 2019 and it goes to 2022, whatever your period is. Uh, the first year of that contract, you would have put out a 470 looking for potential bidders. You decided on this particular company and signed off on a contract with them that has locked you in for three, four, five years, however long it is. But the second year of that contract and the third and any future ones, <clears throat> you do not want to open up a new bidding process because you've already contracted with somebody. So you don't do the 470 for those uh, following years, you sit back and wait and you just do the 471, the second form, where you're just pretty much telling USAC, yes, we're still with them, we're still with that company, and we're still getting the same service. So you do still have to do E-rate every year, you just start with the second form, not the first. You don't want to open up yourself up to new bids. <clears throat> now, once that contract is does expire and ends, that year you would then do a new 470 to start up again and reset and potentially get a new contract with that company or with someone else. <clears throat> a, another uh, time when you do not need to do a 470 is if you can find this deal, basically something at a really good speed at a really good price. Uh, this is a particular setup that the FCC has determined it would be really good for libraries and schools to have. Uh, at least 100 megabits per second download, and it costs $300 or less a month. And, and if this is something you can get, you don't actually have to do any competition. Uh, the FCC was doing this to try and encourage service providers to offer this as a, as a basic service. Uh, when I first started talking about this, uh, I had libraries who said, that's not out there. Not, I know my company, they don't have 100, they have 50 maybe, uh, they have 90 maybe megabits per second of a speed, but not 100. Uh, and when the FCC put this out, the idea was if we give this as a as an option and say you don't have to compete with anybody, you automatically get this library's business. That will hopefully encourage the com companies to offer this as a standard, and then everybody is much easier dumped right into E-rate. All you got to do is start with a 471 as well, saying we got this deal. <clears throat> so here is what we are um, going with. I know some libraries had mentioned to me, oh, my, my provider actually, in the training a few years ago, my provider does 90 megabits per second. I wonder if I could talk to them and convince them to bump it up, and then we get to skip this whole competition thing, this whole open bidding. And I said, that's great, do that. And I don't know what came of that, but uh, hopefully by now, libraries, companies may be offering this more as a standard. But you've got to have this, the cost being um, $300 a month or less, and the speed being 100 megabits down and 10 up, and it has to be also commercially available. Anybody can also get this as well, um, just out publicly. Um, and if you need to have something new installed, that can be included in this as well. So these are just the two very specific times when you don't have to do a 470. But if you're just doing your basic monthly internet, uh, you're doing, you know, want to buy some new equipment, the, the usual, everybody would do a 470 to start off the process. 
Now, to get to your forms um, from your landing page, up top here on the right, you'll see there is a FCC Form 470 link, 471, 486. All your basic forms are right there is where you start a new form. So you click on that and it sets, um, starts you into the form. It pre-fills information from your library's info. So double check all this, make sure it's correct. If anything is not correct, you would go out and fix that in your organization profile and then you have to start a new form. Uh, across the top, it has a bar that will move along as you're going through each step in the form, each, each section, so you can see how far along you are. At the bottom here, you do the first thing you do have to enter is an application nickname. Uh, this is anything you want. It is required. This is not anything that is determined by USAC. It's something you make up yourself. Um, I put in here FY 2021 470, so funding year 2021, um, my 470. But you can name it anything you want. If it's if it whatever makes um, makes it easy for you to remember which form this is and what it was for. If you're doing a special construction project, you could put in special construction. You could say it's for internet or routers, switches, whatever it is that you are doing. It's all for you. Um, it is something that will be on the when if you rate has any questions. Or anything they send to you, they will indicate it's this funding, this form, and here's the nickname for it, so you can match it up. At the bottom here is this is where that discard form button is that I was talking about before. And we had a question right before the break about how do you discard a task, and this is how you would do it. So if you have these tasks floating around in here, they're for create a form 470 or create a form 471. On your task screen, click on one of those tasks to go into that form, and on the lower left, there'll be a discard form button. Click that form, there'll be a confirmation that'll pop up. You say, yes, I wanna discard this, and it will delete the form, and then you'll stop getting those emails uh, sent to you. So make sure that you, you know, like I said, keep your tasks cleaned up that way. Um, now, something that is frustrating, <laughs> I guess, the system, as soon as you click this create FCC form 470 or 471 or 4X, as soon as you click this button, and as soon as you're on this screen, Epic has automatically already created a task for this form. You haven't even entered anything, even if this nickname is blank still. They, right, as soon as clicking that button, that link, it's set up a task. So you may do this and say, oh wait, I actually meant the 470, hang on. And you just go back to your main screen, do a four, or I meant 471, go back to your screen, do a 471 instead. And that, But then this one is still floating around out there. Um, you haven't even entered any info, haven't saved anything, but it's already started saving it. It's just how quickly the system works. So just pay attention, um, keep an eye on your tasks, and go in and clean up and discard anything that you know you're not going to be working on. But we're going to actually go through doing this form. Once you enter your nickname, you've got two buttons over here, save and share and save and continue. Save and share would only be if you're going to need to send this form to someone else in your Epic account. So if, for example, you have a staff person that can complete the form, enter the information into the form, but then they have to send it to you to verify or double check as the administrator as in, or as the one authorized to actually submit the form, they could then share it to you. Um, Generally, we don't have that in here. I know it's, you can do that. Most of the time, there's just a single person who's in charge of E-Rate and they just do everything themselves, but it is there. What you usually wanna do is just save and continue, which goes on to the next page of the form. So on the next screen of your 470, there's nothing to enter here. This is just uh, filling in information based on your profile. It doesn't let you know um, if you need to fix anything, go into manage your organization. At this point, it does assign a form number to this form. Every form, your 470, 471, 46, they also are assigned a little a number. This is a way you can track this particular form for this particular year as well. And this is what USAC will refer to when they email you or contact you. They will say 470 form number 21000126. So that's how you can know that that's the right form. And you can see here on the lower left now, there's also now a back button. Um, as I said, this does save as you go, but you can always, if you realize you need to go back to a previous screen at any point and fix something, you can always click the back button and go back, 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 back until you get to where you need to change something and then continue on again. Um, you can always discard the form at any point, not just on that first screen. So no matter how deep you get into this, as long as you haven't submitted the form, certified and submitted it, you can always discard. And then we do our save and continue. 
Uh, the next screen is has consultant and contact info. Consultant information most likely will be blank for you. There are companies out there, firms that you can pay to do your E-rate forms for you. This is generally for larger organizations like uh, large library systems or large school districts who need someone who's a real E-rate expert and they don't have that person on their own staff and they pay the company to do this for you. Um, that's what that would be for. Um, I do help you with consulting. I'm your state E-rate coordinator, but I'm not that kind of a consultant where you pay me anything, so I, I don't appear on your forms at all. Um, at the bottom, then, then it asks for contact. Are you the main contact person? Um, you would click yes, and it will automatically fill in your uh, information here, will appear. If you're not, you'd say no and put someone else in, but generally it's you. Save and continue. And then this is where you can decide what you want to apply for, Category 1 and Category 2. You can do just a Category 1 470 if you want to, with just your monthly internet costs if you want. You can do a form that's just all Category 2, purchasing equipment and, and doing all of that. Or you can do a 470 that has both of them on the form itself. Up to you what works best for you to keep track of everything you're doing. I know many people do like to do them separately so they can say, say this is everything that has to do with my purchasing of equipment and this is everything that has to do with just our regular monthly internet that we always do every year. Um, if you do them separate, you're going to have two Form 470s that you'll be submitting and that you'll have to make sure get done and certified with everything done. You'll do one, all your Category 1, and then a second one with everything um, doing Category 2 up to you what works best for your organizational purposes. For this example and this demo, I'm doing both so you can just see how both of them do work. Um, so we've clicked on both of those buttons and save and continue. Then it will ask if you have an RFP for this. Um, if you are doing there we go, a uh, in-depth project, something with a lot more uh, like updating your computer lab or building a whole new library, you probably have a lot of detail about how the construction is going to be done and what will need to be done for the internet to be set up and all the equipment to be put in. And you'll have some sort of document about that that your municipality or your library has put together. Um, if you need to provide that information because it relates to the service you're looking for, you would you can this is where you can um, attach that RFP and you would put that in here so all the bidders have access to that info. You can click and drag it to here, or you can click on up to load, and it will go out onto your computer for you to find wherever that document is. Also, if you are doing special construction that we talked about earlier, you're going to have to have an RFP for that. Um, as I said, we have templates here that we're working with to help our libraries who want to do that special construction and that matching, and then you know, apply for that state match. Um, so we can you can work with Holly Wolt here at the commission and she'll work with you on that, and then you would attach that here. But if you're just doing a very simple application, it's just our regular monthly internet like we always do, or we're just buying some new wireless access points, nothing complex, you would say no. So it would depend on your situation. Save and continue. And now here's where we can add our um, what they call their service requests, what we're looking for. You'll see there's uh, for category one and category two are in two separate sections and it says there are currently no category one service requests because we haven't done anything yet. So you click on the blue button, we're going to do a category one with uh, for add new service request. And then this opens up where there will be a pull down menu with all your options, but then right at the bottom, which is very important, there is descriptions and explanations about each of the things you can get here. I'm going to go over some of these here now. There's your least lit fiber. This is just regular old fiber that we're looking for, you know, the usual fiber that we have. And if we were going to look for that, then the next three options are kind of related to each other. Internet access and transport bundled non-fiber. So this would be for any other kind of internet connection that's not your fiber connection. So either you have fiber or you don't. That's kind of the, the two choices. Um, if you have fiber or you're looking for fiber, you do the lit. If you have Anything else, you do this second one, Internet Access and Transport Bundle. Now, some people do get a little confused in our small individual libraries because following that, there is a transport only, no SISP service included, and then Internet Access, ISP service only, which catches a lot of people's attention because, yes, I want Internet Access. I'll pick that one. These two are separated out here because there's Internet Transport separate, Internet Transport Bundled, these are separated out because in some larger school districts or larger um, 
uh, library systems, they do pay for these each separately, to maybe to different companies even, or totally separate out on their bills, so they have to ask for them separately. 95% of you guys just doing this as an individual library, you don't do that. It's not a thing. <laughs> so you need to do the bundled one. If you just do internet access service, you're getting the service, but you're not getting the transport of getting that service to your building. That's the difference. Don't panic if you've done that by accident. Uh, USAC knows that this is something that commonly is um, done as a mistake, and they will reach out to you when they get to their, we're questioning, we have some questions about your application, we wanna help you work on it, and give you an opportunity to fix that. But just try not to do that. You're either lit, you either have fiber, or you have everything, and you want it bundled. You, you want the service itself, and you wanna get it to your building. That's the, so you wanna choose the bundled one. Beneath that is the dark and lit together. So if you are interested in investigating, is there any dark fiber out there that I'd like to find out about and have turned on so I can use, that would be you do the least dark and lit together. Uh, the other options here are generally things you probably wouldn't use if you're gonna be running your own internet surface. I doubt any of us are doing that. Um, some network equipment, maintenance, uh, air cellular data, some uh, uh, Cellular data plans would be uh, what you would use to get internet to a bookmobile, potentially. Uh, that, so that will only be used for that situation. So we'll open up this pull-down menu here, and now we have all our choices. And I'm going to do a my basic uh, internet service of internet access and transport bundled. So if I choose that, it then refreshes the screen and asks me some specific questions about that service. <clears throat> Depending on which item I pick, it may ask differently, um, different uh, kind of questions. Uh, but quantity, how many connections, how many circuits, how many connections do I want, how many internet connections do I want coming into the building? Just one is fine. Number of entities served, I'm just one library, so I'm just one. And then you want to do your speed. What is your minimum you're, you're requesting and your maximum speed you'd like to have? Um, in this case, you want to make sure if you're just continuing with whatever your current internet is, connection is make sure you know what your speed is and make sure it falls between the minimum and maximum here. If you're trying to expand your connection potentially, make sure whatever you might be looking for falls between your minimum and maximum. So there, if you open up these pulled up these menus, you'll see this actually goes up into the gigabit speeds, which is even faster than megabits per second. And it is like one megabit or one gigabit, five, 10, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, so if you're looking for something for fiber, that's where we're getting into the gigabit speeds. You would definitely want to make sure you include that. What's here on your 470s, you want to, you, as I said, you want, you're dreaming. What could we possibly get? You may investigate, see, you know, look on a company's website and see, oh, they actually offer five megabits or five gigabits per second. Let's put that on here and see if we can get it. And now, or see what it's going to cost us for E-rate, via E-rate. Uh, if you put down here like 25 is the minimum and maybe 50 is the maximum and your provider comes back and says actually we can offer you 100 megabits per second, then you're going to, you have just lost out on getting E-rate discount on it because you only made, you made your maximum 50 megabits. You've got to make it sure that your, in whatever speed you end up getting falls in that range that you asked for in the first place. You can't on your second form, when you tell it USAC on the 471, we went with this company and they offer 100 megabits per second. If you only ask for a maximum of 50 on your 470, doesn't match up, you're not going to get, you're going to be denied. So think big on the 470, think over big. Even think oversized, that in fact, don't even know if anybody offers five gigabits. Do it anyway, it doesn't matter. On your 471, that's when you'll say what you actually ended up with, but you wanna make sure it falls in here, into the range. Now, the last question here is, that, do you need it installed or not? If it's something new, a new service, you would wanna say yes. But in this case, I'm gonna say, this is just my regular monthly internet. I've always been getting for years and years. It's already installed, so I don't need it installed now. And then you click the add button on the bottom. And now, back uh, it pops you back to your main page of your service request. You'll see it lists what you um, requested here. Internet access, bundled, 25 to 100 megabits, et cetera. Now, if I did also want to explore getting fiber as an option, I would click Add New Service Request button again and add a second request where I choose lit fiber or the dark and lit fiber, whichever I'm thinking about doing and just keep adding until you've got them all listed there. There's also a narrative box down here where you can explain a little bit if you want to do a little more detail than just, I want an internet connection at this speed. 
I write things like this, monthly internet service for a public library, whatever um, you might need to add. Uh, sometimes there's more detail you want to give, but it doesn't require a whole RFP, a whole giant document. That's where you can put some of this kind of smaller uh, details in here. Now we scroll down a bit on this page and we have an installment payment plan question. As you can see here, this is only related to doing special construction and about the non-discounted fees charges. So there's anything that is not um, eligible for E-rate, other costs related, and you want to, and you want to work with your company on having an installment plan so you can pay a little bit as you go, gradu paid off gradually, you would say yes there. Uh, we're not doing that on this application, so I'm saying no. But now we're going to go down and do a Category 2 request. Just like Category 1, you add a new service request. Um, but in this case, it looks different because it talks about what are your Category 2 services. There's the internal connections, that's all your different pieces of equipment, the basic maintenance of them, as I mentioned, and then managed internal broadband services. This is something called uh, also called managed Wi-Fi, uh, where you can have a company that runs your internet for you and you just don't have anything to do with it. You just totally hand it over to them. Uh, depends on if that's a situation that's available in your area. Um, for internal connections and the maintenance of them, you would have to do a service request twice for each piece of equipment. First, you would say, I want to purchase the equipment, and then I also want maintenance on that equipment. You go the second time and do the maintenance one. Um, for future years, if you already purchased equipment, you can continue doing basic maintenance on them as a service request, as a Category 2, uh, just for the you know following years. So I'm going to, and you can see here is all your different pieces of equipment, cables, racks, routers, wireless access points, antennas, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to pick here, oh, cabling. So um, my internet connection cable. And then in this case, it's going to ask, it's going to start asking specific questions depending on what piece of equipment you're asking for, what it needs to know about that piece of equipment. Um, in this case, it wants to know feet. How many feet of cable do I need? I'm not really sure how much it takes, so I just, on a whim, I put in, I just guess, a thousand feet of cabling to wire up my computer lab. I don't know if that's enough, but that's just for demo. Then you can pick a manufacturer if you have a preference. I, I don't know a lot about manufacturers. I just usually put nothing, no preference, because it, whatever the company comes back to me with is fine. Um, number of entities served, I'm still one library. And in this case, yes, I would like someone to come in and install the cable. I don't know anything about that. And I hit add. And now there is your category two, just like in the category one one. You're, it's an internal, your cable, how many feet it is, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if I want to order, I want to get E-rate on other pieces of equipment, I just go and do add a new service request and pick one of those. Pick the router, pick the um, um, power supply, whatever it is that I'm looking for, racks, and just keep doing over and over again, add a new service request, do another piece of equipment, add a new service request, do another piece of equipment, on and on until I've requested all of the pieces of equipment I might want to be purchasing in the next year. So this isn't just, I want everything, you know, everything I'd ever want. It's, I'm thinking about in 2021 funding year, what might I be buying? Now you may be thinking of things for future years, and that's fine, you'll do those on future applications. But this is just, what do I think I'll buy in 2021? So I'm not going to go through that for each one because I just showed you the basics of how it works here. But I'm going to show you now, after I've done this two more times, I added a router. I picked router, and I just need one new router that I would like to have installed. And you can see here, the unit, is rather than how many feet, it's just how many each. And then um, WAP is wireless access points. I'm also getting three wireless access points to extend my internet connection out. There's also a narrative here if I feel the need to explain anything about any of these Category 2 uh, requests. And then I'm going to zoom out here and show you. Now here is my finalized service requests application. Uh, category 1 for the internet access, my basic monthly, and Category 2 of the different pieces of equipment I'm planning on purchasing this next year. Uh, once I have, and I just keep adding new as I get everything on here that I'm going to be doing in the next year. Once I'm happy with everything, I got everything on there I need to do, I save and continue. It will then ask me if I have a tech, uh, technical contact person. Uh, do I have some other person I would like these companies to contact to ask about this equipment or the service rather than me? Um, in many libraries, it's I'm director, I'm the only one, it's me. <laughs> but you may have some tech person either on your staff or in the community who you would like them to talk to rather than contacting you about it. If you don't, you would just say no. 
If you do, you can say yes. You can search the system if you wanted to for some reason. Some some library some organizations do give their tech person access to E-rate because they help them a lot with the E-rate forms. But if it's just they don't have anything to do with E-rate itself, but they do are the person you just want them to talk to, you'd rather have a service provider talk to them about what kind of router or what kind of connection. Um, I wouldn't give them a whole user account in the Epic system. That's not necessary because you can enter their details just manually here and just give it on the fly. So I enter the name, phone number, and email address so that the service providers can contact um, my technical person instead of me. And then save and continue. Their next question is about state or local procurement requirements. Are there any rules about how you have to do competitive bidding? Uh, at the state level, we don't have anything that specifically talks about that, but you would have to know if there's anything at your local level. Does your municipality or your county or whoever you work with have any rules about competitive bidding that has to be done? Um, you say yes here. This is the kind of thing you could add in just like you do an RFP where you could, if there's a separate, a specific separate document, you could upload it or you can enter a link if there's something out on the city website that says here's all the information about any companies that want to bid with us, you could just put that link in there for their information. So you're going to have to know that locally. And now that's all the information we need to enter for our form. We now can go, instead of save and continue, we review our 470. Once we hit review, it says when it's ready, a task will become available. So what the system is doing right now is on their side, it's generating the form itself, putting all the final information is, and creating a PDF for you to review. Uh, this could take a couple of minutes to have to work and to be done. I have um, had to wait 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes sometimes before it's all ready. But what you would do is go to your tasks, click on tasks, and see if there's something that says like this, certify FCC Form 470 rather than create. You need the certify one and that's the one that goes on to the next step. Most likely when you first come to the screen, it won't be there. I don't think I've ever seen it there immediately <laughs> as long as I've been doing this. Uh, just wait for it to appear, refresh the screen, you refresh your browser screen every now and then. Um, and like I said, 30 seconds, a minute, two minutes, you should eventually see it appear. Once it is there, the certify one, you click on that task. And now you, this is where you're doing your final step of certifying and signing off on the form. There is a link to view the PDF. And you notice over here now, our continue to certification button, it's kind of grayed out. It's a light blue, not a bright blue. It's not alive yet. You can't click on it until you check this box saying that everything's correct. There's also a send for certification button. This is what I was talking about before. If there's another staff person that this needs to be sent to for them to certify, this is not sending it to USAC. It's once again, another confusing wording. This is sending it to someone else. Like if you have one person that completes all the information in the form, but you as the director is the only one authorized to submit it. So they would fill it out to here and then send it to you, to your user account within Epic to, to actually certify. You just want to use the continue to certification to actually do it. If you're sure everything is fine, you can just click the box and continue. But if you want to look at the PDF, you click on the link here and it will open up a PDF in whatever you use for viewing those and you can just see um, here's the basic info here's what i entered there's a category one there's a category two and just make sure everything is correct <clears throat> um, if everything is good then you just go back and you check the box and continue to certification if you notice something needs changing there's a back button here you can always go back to any previous step and um, change something now this pdf here since you are opening it up, you can save it or download it if you want to, but to have your records. But at the end of the form, I'm going to show you how you can get the final version of this form with the certification, with the date and time, so when you actually submitted it for your paper files or your electronic paper files. And that's the one that you should download and save for your records after you've completed everything. So we've checked the box because everything looks good. Continue. And it says, are you sure you want to go on and certify? Yes, we do. And now this is all of the, this is the certification page, all the legal stuff, everything you have to agree to, to uh, complete the form. So it's all the legal notifications and all these boxes that you have to check. And I'm going to zoom in on these so you can see them, but I'll just point out also on the lower right, again, this certify, this is the final certify button is also grayed out, not bright blue. It's not live yet and it's not clickable until you check all of these certification buttons. 
So I'll zoom in there. And you do have to check every single one. There's not a choice to make here of what I agree to. You have to agree to all the terms of uh, the ERA program. Um, I certify the applicant includes libraries or library consortia eligible for assistance. I certify that um, every, all information will be available to review by bidders. I will retain the required documents, et cetera, et cetera. You're welcome to read through all of it. I'm not going to read all these certifications off to you, but it's just basically you saying, yes, I agree to all the rules and regulations in the E-rate program. Once you've checked all those boxes, then you'll notice the certify button does become bright blue, and now you can click on it and submit your form. So once you hit that certify button, this last one, you have submitted your form. It will give you a little pop-up, and this is the scary uh, uh, question of false statements from this form may result in civil liability and or criminal prosecution. Um, that is true. There you, you can. There are things you shouldn't be doing. Don't try and scam the system or work with a service provider to give them a leg up on doing getting your business. Um, but ideally, I hope none of you guys are doing anything illegal. I don't think anyone here has done anything like that. So you do just have to say, yes, I do agree that I am not going to do anything illegal related to my E-rate. You say yes, and now it's submitted. It pops you back to the tasks where it had left off when you're doing that certify, and you'll notice that certify task is now gone because you did it. And your form is submitted. Now, how do you really know? You want to double check and make sure you have it done? You go back to your landing page, and I'll give you a tip right now too. Anywhere on this in the system where you see a USAC logo, you can click on that and it'll bring you back to your landing page. If you don't see a logo, if you click on reports at the top here, there'll be a return me to my landing page link as well. So we're gonna go back to our landing page and we're gonna go down to the bottom where I showed you earlier how to search for all your forms. And we're gonna look at our 470 for the upcoming year, 2021. And now you'll see I've got a third one because I just did another form. And it's that uh, one with a 126 at the end and it says certified. So I know, yes, I did it, it's done, and USAC has received it. Awesome. Now, I would like a copy for myself. And so if you do want to um, look at the whole form and get your own PDF of the final version, over here on the left, the nickname, this blue, is a hot link. So you click on the nickname for whichever one you want to open up. And it will give you a version showing you the whole form on the screen here. But get a nice pretty PDF version of it. Up here at the top menu, and we're going to zoom into that, there's this uh, generated documents uh, option. And if you click on that, it will open up and you can click on original version of the form. And here are the upload date, that's the date you submitted the actual form. Click on where it says original version, and you get a PDF that looks just like the draft one that we had, but this is the final version. It has um, application filing number, all your information up here and the first page, second page, but now you'll see it also has the certifications. All the certifications you agreed to are now in the PDF. So this makes it about three, four pages long. And then at the very end, your signature, you're authorized, and the date and time that you actually submitted it. This is the final version of it in a PDF form. This is the one that you wanna download, save, print out, whatever you do to keep your uh, records and paper documents of this. In response to your 470, they will send you a receipt notification. And every time you submit a form to USAC, they always come back to you with a letter, letter, an email, something within your ERA account saying, yes, we got it. Yes, we got it. This comes up in your newsfeed, that one newsfeed of your own. And it's something you can look at to see everything you submitted. You can also make changes at this point. If you realize after sitting certification submitting that you did make some sort of a typo change, you can make corrections using this uh, notification. This also gives you what your allowable contract date is. Allowable contract date, this is the 28 days after you've submitted the 471, 470, and when you can, meaning when you can do your 471. So they will do the math for you. I explained earlier that when you do the 470 open bidding, then you gotta wait 28 days to make your decision. They will tell you what that 28 days is in your letter. Now, from the form itself, when you're looking at that or you know that to generate the documents for to get that PDF, next to it you can click news and there is your uh, receipt notification letter. You could also go to news from your main landing page, click on your library's name, go to news, it'll be there as well. And this is where it gives you your allowable contract date. 
and it tells you 12, 14, 20, 20. So you know, okay, I've got about 20 days now before I can do the second step in the process, the 471. Um, yeah. All right, so that is our 470 has been submitted. Anyway, any questions about the 470 itself? <clears throat> Anything you enter on there? <clears throat> All right. So as I said, the 470 opens up a competitive bidding process. Competitive bidding is a the formal process where you open up your library for bids and companies may reach out to you and submit their quotes for any of the work you want to have done. Um, you may receive none, you may receive one. Uh, it depends on what you're asking for and your situation in your community. Many of our small communities, they only have one service provider, so it, it is who it is, and that's who you get. <laughs> uh, sometimes, depending if you're doing something more complex, like a construction project or buying equipment, you might have some new companies reach out to you. But you do have to evaluate all of these. They will um, send you bids, you will then compare all the offers received and uh, select one of them. You do have to wait those 28 days after you um, submit your 470, wait for that allowable contract date before you can make your final decision. Even if you get the good bid in you know, a week after you submit your 470, that's fine. You've got to hold on to it and wait 28 days before you sit back and make your official decision and then go on to the next steps in the um, E-rate process. To do competitive bidding, you must have a fair and open bidding process. This means you can't give anybody any extra information. You can't treat anyone um, differently, even if it is your own local company. You can't go to them and say, "Hey, I did a 470. Hey, well, let's do this." Um, you've got to make sure, make you know, treat everybody with the same. Um, work responses. Uh, your companies, your service providers cannot be involved in creating your 470. You cannot go and work with your company, even if someone you currently work with or one you want to work with and say, hey, I'm going to do E-rate. Let's work together to submit this application. The 470 has to be just you as the library looking for someone to provide you with this service or this equipment or do this construction. What you can do is go to their websites and investigate. You know, I was talking about speeds earlier. Find out what speeds do they offer? So I know what broad range to ask for in the 470. You can find that out from many companies' websites. You could also contact them and ask for information about what they do provide. Do not mention E-rate, however. Do not mention I'm doing this for the purpose of doing an E-rate application. Just say, I'm looking for information about what you can do, what you provide. Um, you don't want them to send you a quote before you do your 470. You want to, you know, you can you can ask them what they provide before you submit your 470, but they can't send you a quote until after the 470 has been submitted. It has to be done. Everything has to be done in the right order for E-rate purposes, or you will knock yourself out of doing of receiving the discounts. So you've got to submit your 470 first, and then a quote or a bid needs to be dated and sent to you after the date you submitted the 470. You can't take a previous quote if you had happened to be chatting with someone and use that. They'll have to send you a new one after. Once you do have all these bids and you've decided it's time to make a decision, you, um, in order to make a choice, you do have to do, according to E-rate rules, choose the most cost-effective bid, with cost being your primary factor, but not your only factor. Also, cost-effective does not mean cheapest. I'm sure we've all experienced in our life that um, the cheapest is not always the best in the end, in the long run, <laughs> and you don't always want to go with that. It may be more expensive, but still cost effective because of other factors that you um, take into consideration when you are uh, making a choice. So we have a uh, chart here, a bid evaluation matrix, an example of one that you could use if you need to make this kind of decision. So this would only be if you've received multiple quotes, multiple bids from multiple companies, and you need to make a comparison between them to decide who you're going to go with, or you need to document why you chose a particular company over another one. You're going to need this in case the company or USAC asks you about it later. This is not anything you submit with your application. It's just for your records in case anyone asks. So uh, we talked about that you do have to have cost be the primary factor. So in this example, what we've done is we've 
taken here and listed all the things we think are important in our decision-making process to pick a service provider to give us our internet. Um, price isn't the only thing you always want to think about. Um, do you have a prior experience with this vendor? Do you know them? Are they your current company? Are they another company you know about? What about other things you need to buy from them? Are they good on those prices? How do they invoice you? Are they willing to do a discount on your bills or not? Are they good for the environment? Are they local? Are they not? All these things. And these are just some things you can decide what's important to you. You can pick some of these, you can pick other things. Um, customer service, you've known, you know how their customer service goes. You can put that in, whatever is important to you. And then just assign points to each item with price earning them the most points. Not even half, there's gonna be like 50% of the of the um, points, but just it's worth more, more points than anything else. That makes price the primary factor in your decision-making process. Then you look at the bids you've received and give them their points. And we can see here, vendor two got a full 30 of the price. They're obviously the cheapest. However, vendor three ended up with a total more than either of the other ones. That would mean you can pick vendor three as your company who won the bids in this competition, even though they got a 25 for price, even though their costs were not as cheap as vendor three, with everything else that is important to you and that you took into consideration, they came out on top. And that is perfectly fine. This is how you do this. This is how you make this decision. And this is how you um, would tell USAC or the company or anyone else who asks you about it. Um, so if you have to do this, obviously you can see here where they really went out was the whole prior experience. I'm betting Vendor 2 is probably some new new game in town, new company that came along, and so nobody knows anything about them. So they got a full zero on that one. They also weren't so as good for ineligible services. Um, so yeah, and not as yeah not as good as ineligible services. That's the other one. So there's lots of things here that can take consideration. Now, once you make this decision and you do your second form and the words out who you picked, vendor two could come back to you or go to E-Rate and say, hey, we know we're cheaper than vendor three. They should, why didn't they pick us? I wanna dispute this and that's fine. Just make sure you have this documentation. You can show, well, this is why. This is all that's important to us. And that's how it works. Um, it's not just who's the cheapest. You decide as the library and the applicant what matters to you beyond price being primary, being worth more points. Everything else is up to you to decide what's important to you. And once you show them this, they have no legs like, to stand on to argue. So you would choose vendor three. Now, there's a few situations uh, that are a little um, questions I've had about what, you know, what about special situations that might come up? What if you are brand new to doing E-Rate, but you have a current contract with a company? So you are in a contract right now, you can't really open up for a new, you, know, you can't start a new one, but you want to start doing E-Rate and make that contract work in the E-Rate program. Can we do this? Or do I have to wait till the contract ends? You do not have to wait. You just do a 470 as you normally do. You wait your 28 days, but then you use that current contract you have as one of your bids. It becomes a bid. If you receive other bids or quotes, you'll have to do your comparison and decide. Hopefully your current company will come out ahead um, using your discount matrix and things like this prior experience difference here of getting zero from a new company and you know the most for the current one. That can be very helpful to you in that situation. Um, and so as long as your existing contract's winning bid, then now you can continue on and they win and you can, can go on ahead even though you have that previous contract already in place. So this would be if you're brand new to E-Rate for the first time and you wanna jump in in the middle of a contract. Uh, what about if the city pays for the library's internet? The library doesn't actually have its own just internet bill, that's okay. You can cost allocate out the city's costs from the library's costs. So you'd be, have to be able to separate out how much of the internet service is being used by the library as opposed to anything else the city is paying for. They may be paying one big bill, that is city hall, fire department, library, all their internet service, and that's fine. You just need to be able to see on the bill which part is for each location, or um, you can have an estimate if you think, well, we know the library uses this much and City Hall uses this much, you can try to estimate. 
you might be able to get actual statistics from your service provider. Ask them, can you tell me, we've got these three different connections, one of three buildings, how much of that connection is going to the library and what cost-wise would that be as compared to all the other ones? You can only receive E-rate on the internet service that's going to the library building, not to the other buildings. The city can pay for it all as one big bill, but you've got to be able to differentiate. This is the library's part of the internet, so we're going to ask for an E-rate discount on that cost, not the amount that goes to this. Uh, fire department or city hall. Uh, what if you have one bid or no bids? That's okay. There does not have to be an actual competition, even though it is officially opening a competitive bidding process. Uh, if there's only one bid, you just go with it. That's fine. Write yourself a little email or memo saying we only received one bid from so-and-so company, and that's fine. If you didn't have any bids, you can now, after the 28 days, reach out to your vendors reach out to your current service provider. Maybe they didn't realize and notice you had put something out there. You want to just nudge them and say, hey, we did our E-rate. Are you still on board for that? So you have a confirmation with that. Um, if you were trying something brand new and you know there was companies in the area that could do this, that could give you fiber or do construction, after that 28-day period, you can now contact them, reach out and say, hey, we did this. Are you, do you guys do E-rate? Can you give us a response back? Um, so there is, at that point, it's okay to talk to them. So on or after the allowable contract date, that 28 days, at any point you decide you close the competitive bidding process. And you can choose when you wanna do that. You can dictate that actually in your 470. If you had a whole RFP, you would probably mention it there. In that narrative part, you can say, um, Competitive bidding process will close on, and you can pick a date. It has to be at least the 28 days, but then you can give yourself like 28 days plus a week so that you have that extra week to make any decisions, to reach out to companies, to get something back. Depends on how quickly you think things can work, but you can say this is when it's going to be. Um, or you can just, just you don't have to, you don't have to dictate it, but you can just pick a day and say, okay, we've gotten everything we need. We know what we weren't going to do. Let's do it. There isn't any a real process to close the bidding process. Um, the competitive bidding as in check a box or make an announcement or something, that's, there's nothing within the EPIC system to do that. You just say, today we're done, and you do it. That's when you can do that evaluation, choose who you're going to go with. If you need to, sign a contract or an agreement or a memo, whatever needs to be done. And then you do your 471 telling USAC who you picked. However, and I mentioned this earlier, you can only do your 471 during their application filing window. It's only available for a short period of time uh, during the year, uh, as I said, generally in the spring. So that would be the wrapping up of your competitive bidding process. <clears throat> um, any questions about the competitive bidding before we pop, go on to the next form? As I said, you may or may not even have any competition and that's fine. For many of our libraries, it's not a thing <laughs> just because there's only one company in town and it's much easier than all of this that I've explained to you may sound. But if you do receive multiple bids, uh, you will have to do some evaluation. Oh, something I should mention though too, when you do receive these bids, you do have to make sure they're actually responding to what you asked for in the 470. We've had this happen as well. I put out a 470 asking for monthly internet charges and they send me a quote because they do other services as well, send me a quote for cell phone service. Thanks, but that has nothing to do with my E-rate application. <laughs> There's nothing in my E-rate about cell phone service because it's not a thing that's available, eligible. And you didn't mention anything in your quote or your contact with me about what I did ask for, my monthly internet cost. In that case, you can just ignore that bid, that quote completely. If they don't respond to what you actually asked for, it doesn't matter. Hold on to it just for ref, you know, for paperwork purposes in case somebody questions, we sent you something, then you can say, yeah, you asked, sent me a thing for a cell phone, I asked for internet. Not the same thing. So um, that will come up. So pay attention, read the quotes and the responses you receive and make sure it's actually what you matches up with what you asked for. If it doesn't, you don't have to do it. Um, also, if um, after the 28 days, you may start a conversation with a company and saying, hey, you know, your pricing is really good. I'd love to uh, talk more about this. And you could um, say, you know, 
we've had this happen before too, where a company is just doing kind of a fishing expedition, seeing what they could, you know, they noticed com um, libraries asking for what they do. And so they send a response and then you reply and say, oh yes, I'm at so-and-so town in, in, you know, way in Western Nebraska. And they say, where? We don't, we don't serve that area. We don't have any business there. We don't do business there. All right, then you wasted everybody's time by responding sending this quote. It happens. Uh, that's another one you can just ignore. You do not have to compare them if they then reply to you and say, oh, we actually don't do business in, you know, so-and-so town in Nebraska. Sorry. Hold on to it, but just set it aside. It doesn't need to be taken in cons into consideration. So just because you receive a quote doesn't mean you have to evaluate it. Take a look at it. Make sure it's responding to your 470. Make sure the company actually does business in your town. Only those valid ones are the ones you have to do any sort of a comparison of. All right, no more questions here. All right. <clears throat> Let me get another drink here. So the second form in the E-rate process is your 471. This is the form everybody has to submit this one, as opposed to there's a couple of exp um, exceptions for the 470. Uh, you do this one every year to let USAC know what who of you have chosen your service provider and what services they're going to be getting. Um, if you have a multi-year contract, this would be your second, third year of the contract. You do this to let them know you're still with that company. Um, for something new, you'd be letting them know who you went with, um, the certifying compliance with this, your discount calculation comes in on the in this form. At this point, this is when you can communicate with the FERB provider. I said with the 470, when you're first reaching out, you cannot have them help you work on your form. On the 471, yes, you can because you might need information from them about how this is going to work, what they're going to do, um, what it's going to cost. You're going to need to have the back and forth with them at this point. And so now they can help you to make sure you get the right information into the 471. You'd also want to talk to them about how you're going to do the invoicing part. How are you going to receive your discount? Is it going to be a discount automatically on your bills or is it going to be a reimbursement after the fact? So the 471 can be done after the 470 has been out there at least 28 days. As I said, you've reached that little contract date. You've made your choice, you've signed your contract, made your agreement, and then it has to be during that application filing window. The filing window usually, as I said, is between January and March. Um, it's when it's been falling most recently. Right now, as of now, USAC has not announced the dates. The dates do vary. There's not a set January, beginning of January, end of March. So it's specific dates, and they announce those dates usually sometime in December. So sometime next month, we'll know what that actual window is. Right now, you can't even do a 471. If you try to, it'll say, sorry, the window's not open, come back later. So um, that's one good thing. You cannot accidentally <laughs> go in and do it earlier than the window opens. Uh, it just won't um, be available to you. You do have to wait until that 28 days has passed, though. That is very important. Do not jump the gun on that. If you do your 470 now, that's great you'll definitely have more than 28 days before the window opens in January. But you can still keep doing your 470 in January and February if that's when you finally get around to it, and that's fine, but you've got to make sure you don't jump the gun and do the 471 too early. If you do, you've also knocked yourself out of getting E-rate discount because you've um, broken the E-rate rules and done it in the wrong time frame. Uh, we recommend don't wait to do your 470, your first form. There's no reason to wait. It's available now. If you know what you're going to be looking for, go and do it right now. Do it today. Do it tomorrow. Do it next month. <laughs> when you know, As soon as possible, there's no reason to wait. You could even start it back in the summer when it was first available. Um, because the earlier you get it out there, then you know you're definitely going to have those 28 days before you even get close to the filing window and do the 471. Um, Lots of people do ask me, well, what is the deadline for submitting a 470? There's got to be a final date, and there is. We don't know the deadline until we know the actual dates of the filing window. Because what it will be is, whatever is the close of the filing window, the last date you can submit the 471, back up 28 days, that will be the deadline for the 470. So you, there will be a deadline. As soon as the, the filing window dates are announced, then we'll be able to do that math and figure it out. Um, but if you wait until the deadline, as many of us tend to do, you may have issues if they're in, you might not be able to get your form in on time. If on that date there is um, 
a problem that your internet's down for some reason, if there's a storm, if there's a blizzard, we're in Nebraska in the spring, there's going to be, um, and you can't get to your library or get to a connection. If USAC system is having technical issues, when it gets down to that deadline date, things are delayed because every, people rushing in the last minute. So please just don't wait to the deadline um, to do that because you might end up having so many other issues or if you're ill that day and you can't do it, you just don't get your E-rate. Um, also, if you wait to the de last date on the 470, then you have to do your 471 on its last date as well and you could encounter the same issues. What if there's weather? What if the internet's down? What if I'm ill on that one date? You want to give yourself more wiggle room than just those single individual dates. So get your 470 done now, get it done before the end of the year, and then you know you've got plenty of time in the spring to get the 471 done. <clears throat> Uh, what is actually one nice thing that USAC does do is they do send you a notification, an email to your personal email account letting you know that the allowable contract date has been reached for the 470. So um, if you're not sure, you know, maybe you didn't note it in your calendar, you weren't sure, wait until you receive this little, this poke, this nudge, and then you know I'm good, I'm past that 20 days, now let's start evaluating, let's see what bids we've got, let's get that 471 in. This will be emailed to you, and it will also be in your news section in your E-Rate account. Now, to do the 471, it is also in the top menu here. Uh, like I said, it's not available right now, so I don't have screenshots to show you, but I will talk to you about the format of the form um, that you, so you know. The um, 471 can be a little confusing. It is a two-step process. You first have to put in the request itself saying what the service is that you're looking for and then you have to go into that request you've created and enter the cost information and the specific details. Um, a, lot, and a lot of people kind of get confused and lost in this process, don't realize that I have to go create it first and then go in and do something more. It's a little extra work than when you did the 470 which was just create the funding request and it's all in there. Um, one key uh, to remember if you've done this right or not, and so you don't get the error messages. If you haven't entered um, money information, you know, the amount it's going to cost you, you haven't finished the request. That's what goes in the line item information, is how much is it going to cost me. If you haven't done that and you're trying to go further on in the form and it's throwing errors out at you, that would be why. So you just create the request, then go into that request you've created and provide the cost information. Something else to be aware of is you have to sep submit separate 471s for each category, category 1 and category 2 of E-Rate. For the 470, as I told you, you can submit one 470 that has both of those in them, but once you get to the 471, you have to do them separately because they do the funding differently. As I mentioned, category 1, it's a straight, you get a discount on whatever you purchase, but category 2 uses that budget the category two budget. So within the system, they need two separate 471s to process two different ways. So if you are requesting both category one and category two services in the same year, you're going to be doing two form 471s. You're going to create one and do everything that talks about your category one basic internet and the cost of that, submit and certify that one. Then you're going to start a whole second 471 that talks about your category two services and all those per equipment and um, purchases that you're doing and submit that one. You also receive in response to the 471, a receipt knowledge acknowledgement letter, just like the 470, summarizing it. You can make changes to this one as well, same thing. Um, you can also request changes in the funding if you just realize, oops, actually the costs have changed now from the provider. Um, you can reduce funding, but not increase it. So make sure you have it correct before you do your 471. And this comes to you within your E-Rate news account, news section as well. Now, once you've submitted your 471, it goes into application review. And this is where the waiting game starts. This is where you wait for them to review it. Uh, application review could take months. You, you know, you have a deadline to submit it sometime in March. They could not, might not respond to you and make their final decision until April, May, June, July, August. Yes, even into the funding year that you're applying for. And that's okay, they have so many applications that they receive, it sometimes takes time to get through all of them. But even if you don't have your answer until it's during the funding year, like after that July 1st, get in August, September, October, that's okay. You will receive the funding going all the way back to the July 1st, the beginning of the full funding year. You don't get, you don't lose any of that. You'll just get a credit from your service provider for those previous, those months. 
So application review is done by the PIA, Program Integrity Assurance Department and USAC. And they will um, check and make sure everything's correct in your form, everything's legal, you checked all the right boxes, verify everything you did. They may reach out to you with questions and allow you to make changes or fixes to things on the form. If they do, you'll receive an email sent to you to your email account and it will say, uh, click here now to go into your Epic account and review the inquiries that we have for you. If you have any confusion or questions about this, this is the time to call me or email me and I will help you interpret what they're saying. Uh, they can sometimes use what I call uh, E-rate ease. It can be a little uh, convoluted how they explain it. They use like three paragraphs for something that could have been two sentences. Um, they have to do a lot, you know, here's what it was going on, here's how the program works, but this is what we need from you. If you can't interpret and figure out what they're asking for, just let me know. I can get into there and look at it and you can send me what they're asking you and I can help you translate what they want to and get them the right information. Um, it might be just changing a checkbox, it might be providing a bill or a quote or a contract, whatever they may need. Uh, and like I said, this can go on for months and months until you get an answer. When they have made the decision, they will send you the Funding Commitment Decision Letter, your FCDL. Um, this is actually an email, a letter email that is, is something that's emailed to you to your e personal email account with and it is uh, attached to that email. This will let you know if you've been funded, if you've been denied, um, if maybe they reduced the funding, they may have with a con in conversation with you decided that certain things you asked for were ineligible or we had to change the costs on things and all those changes will be there. You might get more than one of these emails, especially if you've separated out your Category 1 and Category 2 requests. So you've got two 471s that they're um, evaluating. They may send a different letter for each one. So keep an eye on your emails to make sure everything you asked for, you get responses to. Um, if you disagree, like if you've been denied, you can uh, do an appeal and I can help you do that. I've helped many libraries go through the appeal process and there's information on our website and the USEC website about that if we need to ever get into that. So this is the email you receive and it says USAC Funding Commitment Decision Letter Available for FCC Form 471. And the email itself, it doesn't tell you what their, their answer is, it just says here's your letter. But attached you've got a spreadsheet showing it and then a PDF of the actual letter itself. And so here's the PDF, it says how much has been, what's been committed, it tells you what your next steps are, what you're supposed to do now in the process. If you do need to make an appeal and then specific details about the request, what it was for, what the monthly cost will be, what everything will be, that's all there in your, everything you need to know is in that funding commitment decision letter. Now, as soon as you receive your funding commitment decision letter and you've been approved, immediately you need to go and do your 486. This is the next form of the process. There is no reason to, to wait. There is no delay you need to do. There is no um, like 20 day waiting period or anything. It's immediately, as soon as they've said yes, you go and do this form. However, this is where many libraries kind of lose it in the E-rate process. They've received their funding commitment letter and it says, yes, you've been approved. And they go, yay, you did it, we're done. Well, no, what it really means is they've set aside that money for you, but you need to let them know that you want to accept it and you would like it. Uh, why would you not want to? There are um, possible reasons why things, the situation may have changed. Like I said, it does take months to get it. Uh, the funding commitment letter sometimes. Um, your city or your library may have decided we can't even afford the um, extra part of this. The discount doesn't help. Um, the search provider has changed what they're offering. They've gone out of business. They've jacked up their prices. They've reduced their prices. Um, all sorts of reasons why you might not want to receive, um, accept the funding. So, you, so that's why USEC says, let us know you actually want it. So you've got to do the 46. So you let them know that service has started. You're going to be getting it in as of July. And this is where you certify that you are in compliance with SIPA. This is where that one comes into effect. Now, it's also great about eight, the 46. It's one of the forms that a lot of libraries lose, the, you know, forget to do because they think they're done when they get that letter. But it's also one of the easiest forms to do because you don't have to actually fill in anything. All the information you need is already in your Epic account because you entered it in the 470, you entered it in the 471, USAC entered it there. Um, uh, response there to in the funding commitment letter all of that is in your account you just have to create a 486 and say check yes we want all this stuff and submit it so it's one of the quickest one of the easiest forms to do 
So the 46 is also available in the upper here on the top. I just have a few screenshots of this one, not the full process all the way through because a lot of these forms are similar with the certifications and how to do all of that. But you would go in and you'd choose, you know, put in your nickname, you're the contact person, choose the correct funding year, and we choose whatever the funding year you're doing. It will then bring up all of the funding requests you have submitted for that funding year that you've been approved for. You can see here your status is they're funded. Um, they're up here as the ones you've requested and down at the bottom underneath there is the selected ones. You have to select them and say, yes, we want these. You can see there's a little uh, red triangle with exclamation mark means, means this is information is missing. You need to select something. So we'll automatically default bringing up that funding year's um, requests. So what you would do is you would check in the box for the one that you want and then add it. You can do them one at a time. For some reason, you might want to just one and not the other, or there is an add all button always that you can click on it and we'll check every single one of them. If it's like across the board, yes, we want all of these. Um, in this example, I just checked one and then you click add and now you'll see it bumps down and has also put that one in the selected column uh, section as well. So now it's saying, yes, these are the ones I want. Um, now the buttons in front of these are just to um, remove them. There's nothing going into there to make changes. All the information is just built in there. So you're just selecting the one you want, moving it down, continue. Um, when you get to the certifications on the 486, some things I want to notice, um, make sure you know here, there's the square box ones, which just that's legally as you have to agree to. The SIPA certifications, this is where you do have to make a choice about where you are in the being in compliance with SIPA. Um, the first choice is we are in compliance, so you would check that one if you've got your filters going and you're good. Uh, the last choice I'm going to bump down to, that is SIPA does not apply. This is for previous applications where there are some um, situations where you didn't need to be in compliance with SIPA. But the middle one here is we are in the process. What's great about USAC and the E-rate and SIPA is that they do give you up to three years to become in compliance to get set up with it. They know that it could take time to make a decision, figure out who you're gonna go with, get everything installed and working and, and have it all up to speed. And as long as you're working towards that, they'll give you your e discount on those services. But you have to make sure you do finally get it all up and going and do become compliant within those three years. Because if you don't and you decide, eh, the filtering didn't work and you back off on it, those previous years that you received discounts from, you have to return that money. So if you're gonna do E-rate, make sure you're gonna follow through and being compliant with SIPA. You don't wanna to have to give back any of your money. The deadline to submit the 46 is um, 120 days after your service start date, which is July 1st, or the date of whenever you received your funding commitment decision letter, which I said can sometimes come after July 1st. Um, to start with, if it is July 1st, October 29th would be the deadline for it for anything that you receive July 1st and after. If it's anything later than that, your deadline would you know bump ahead whatever 120 days is after your letter. Um, USAC will notice and pay attention to libraries who have been approved and received kind of funding commitment and nudge you to say, hey, your 46 is due, is coming up. I also do that myself as well. I proactively keep an eye on everything you guys are doing. And in the beginning of October, I will send emails to anybody who I know has been approved for funding but has not done a 46 yet. And so you will get an email from me saying, hey, I've noted you, I, you have not done this form. You need to do it. Otherwise, you're going to lose some of your E-rate um, funding. With the 46, any days you um, submit it late, you'll lose that day's worth of, so if you don't do it on October 29th and you do it on October 30th, you'd lose one day's worth of um, funding, whatever the math comes out to that. So I will nudge you and let you know that you do need to get these in as well. You will also receive a letter sent to you and the service provider letting you know that the 46 has been processed. This is the form that the service provider looks for to make sure that you're good and, um, and you are accepting the information, accepting the funding so that they can go ahead with um, the invoicing if they're going to discount you on the bill or if they're going to, you know, however they're going to provide the service. You'll also receive this notification letter in your E-rate news. So now we're on to the last form of the process. Now I know we are a little late here. We started a little late. I apologize for that. It is a little after 1230, but I'm gonna keep going until I finish through everything. 
Um, please stick with me if you're able to. Um, we're recording all of this. There will be recording late, available later. Um, if you do have any questions about any of the forms, get it into the question section and I can answer them for you um, right now as well. So please go ahead and type in there. I'll keep an eye on it. I've got the window open here for any questions you have. So the last form in the E-rate process is your invoicing form. This is your 474 or a 472. Now you have two choices of how you can receive your discounts. If you want to, if you're going to receive a discount on the bills that you receive from your service provider, then they are responsible for for, for submitting the the SPI form, the service provider invoice form, the one, the number 474. So you will, um, they will submit this to USAC to be reimbursed for whatever they're discounting you. So if this is how your E-rate is being done, then you are done when you've done your 46. Your, your responsibility is done at the end of that third form of the process and you are done. You will now just be getting your service, it will be discounted on your bills automatically and it's up to the service provider, for it's a, their responsibility to get their money back from USAC, not up to you at all. Now, if you are not getting a discount on your bills, you're having to pay things in full and you want to receive a reimbursement after you've paid them, then you would submit the 472, which is called the BEAR form, the Build Entity Applicant Reimbursement form. Um, this is filed by you. Um, it is, and you generally would do this after the funding year is over. You've paid all your bills in full and then after the year is over, you would submit this. Um, this one is also conveniently due also 120 days, but 120 days after the last date of service, which is June 30th, or the date when you did your 486. That, you know, that depends on when you got your funded commitment letter, so sometimes it might be bumped a little. This also ends up falling at the end of October, October 28th, if it's before the, it's on the regular schedule. So I also, just like with the uh, 46, I do pay attention to anyone who has um, gone through a full year of E-rate, and I can look up and see if USAC has distributed any of the funding. And if they say they have not sent anyone any funding, then I will also nudge you and say, hey, if you haven't received your funding, you're going to need to do your bare form. Now, if your service provider has been giving you discounts in your bills, that may be on them. They may have just not submitted their 474, their SPI form, to USAC asking them to reimburse them. Reimburse them. So, um, and it's still on them. Just because you haven't, according to USAC, they haven't sent any money, it's not necessarily your issue. So, if I do reach out to you about a bear invoicing, check your bills. If you've been getting discounts, it's not your problem. It's up to the provider to take care of their issue. If you haven't been and you know you've been filling out, paying everything in full, then yes, you do need to go and do the bear and get your reimbursement. As I said, this is direct um, reimbursement with electronic bank transfers. So if you are doing the bear option, you do have to do that 498 to give them the banking information. You have to do the 498 before you can do the four, the bear form. It won't let you do a bear form until you've given them the banking info. So if you're ever thinking about potentially needing to do a bear form, maybe get this done just for the heck of it, so the info's in there already, and then at any future years when you need to get a reimbursement, the info's already there. Uh, so you will give them the usual banking information. It's just like getting a direct deposit for your paycheck. Um, bank number, routing number, bank account, all of that. You also need to know whatever the um, federal ID number, a tax ID number that your city or your library uses, same for payroll. And then the new number that they're asking for on this, uh, used to identify businesses, a DUNS number. Uh, this is free if you're doing anything federal, E-rate is a federal program, you have to have one of these. You might already have one, just like that FCC number I mentioned way earlier. You can look up on their website to see if they, you have one, and if not, you can reply and request one. Now, to do your 498, it is in a different place than everywhere else, because it's not one of the three forms that you do as a regular as a regular process, and you only do it once. Like I said, you only got to submit the banking information one time. It's in your library's info. So underneath the logo where it says welcome, click on your library's name, and then from this menu, choose related actions. And there's a whole bunch of things you can do here, but about halfway down, there is a create FCC form 498. If you don't see this here, I'd mentioned earlier about permissions, you may need to give yourself the permission to do this. As I said, the account administrator is not automatically set up with full permission to do the 498. 
It's a special one. So you may have to go into your user account, look at your permissions, and give yourself the school or official officer option, turn that on for yourself, then come back here, and then the Create 498 form will um, option will pop up. That also may take a few minutes. Um, I've, I've had to do it for a few people, 30 seconds, a minute, um, two minutes. Do the same thing as with generating your PDFs. Refresh the page a few times, and eventually it will pop up for you. But once it's there, you create it. And I'm not going to go through this whole form either. I don't have banking info to fill in here. But as you can see here, it asks for your company, your library, and then general financial contact numbers, remittance information, all your the usual banking account info that you would submit. Once you submit the 498 form, then they're going to email you and ask for documentation. Just like when you've done a direct deposit type thing, you have to provide a voided check or something. They ask for that as well. Um, a voided check or a copy of a bank statement will work. They also send you to a different website to provide this info and upload this info. They do keep your banking information completely separate from the EPIC system, so there's no security issues there. So there's no, nowhere in EPIC to submit this. You go to the email that they send you, click on that link, go to that web page, and follow their instructions to upload the documentation, the proof of your bank account there. Uh, eventually then they will receive that and look at it all out and they will then issue, um, approve and um, turn on your 498 ID. Until you have that 498 ID turned on, you cannot do a bare form. It won't let you, there's nothing, it won't let you do it because the process can't go through. This can take some time, a few days, a week. So this is not a kind of instantaneous thing. So if you need to do a bare form and get your reimbursement, you want to, like I said, get this 498 work done ahead of time. But once you do receive that email saying, yes, your um, 498 ID has been approved and you have it, then you can go and log into your Epic account. And remember at the beginning I said there's the Epic for everything else and then a separate login for the bear form. You would use that instead. And that will bring you to a new screen to log into. This is the bear form is in what they call the legacy system. Um, this is the previous incarnation of doing um, E-rate online and it's just still in the old system hopefully someday it'll move into epic as well but for now you kind of log into it via epic to start with and then pop over there and to log into this system you do need to have a pin number this is um, a number you may have had if you did do any e-rate before um, it was assigned to you to you do your previous e-rate before epic um, became a thing and you had your username and password you still have that old PIN number, that's what you use here. If you don't have one, you can reach out to Client Service Bureau, if it's customer service, and they will issue one for you. Um, not a problem. And then you just log into there and um, fill in all your bare information to receive your reimbursement. Uh, they will send you a notification letter letting you know that it's been processed, same as everything else. And then you'll also start, no matter which way you're receiving your discount, you're going to start getting quarterly reports, disbursement reports, letting you know, USAC letting you know we've given this, sent this money to wherever. Um, if you're getting discounts on your bills, look at this report and compare it to the discounts your service provider is giving you. Make sure they're giving you the same amount discount of money as your rate is sending them. Um, if you're doing bears where you're getting a reimbursement after you've paid your bills in full, double check your bank account or contact your city clerk or someone to double check it and make sure the amount that USAC says they're sending to you is what's appearing as a direct deposit into your bank account. And so once you've done the 472 or 474, whichever um, one needs to be done for you, you are done with your e-rate process for the year. Yay! And that is it. So. Uh, any questions? We have just a couple more wrap-up slides here, but do you have any questions about the E-rate process you want to ask me now? Uh, type in the question section and we can go over it. Um, anything about anything that we've talked about um, today? We've gone through the, um, I'll keep, keep an eye on the question section here if you type anything in. We've gone through the basics of the program, how it works, what you can apply for, uh, gone through the forms, all the different steps that you need to do to um, have a successful e-rate application. Well, I'm seeing if anybody has any questions. I'll just point out, uh, we do have our e-rate website that I had mentioned, nlc.nebraska.gov slash e-rate, where I have a lot of information for you um, to 
do your applications. There's also some other uh, training that I highly recommend that you take a look at to um, keep up with or learn more about the program. Every year in the fall, USAC does do applicant training workshops. They're usually held throughout the country in multiple locations. This year, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, they were all done online only over a three-day period earlier this month in November, but now recordings of all of those sessions are available. They were each one-hour sessions, so I think there's nine or ten of them out there on different aspects of E-rates. So um, we link to those from our website. You can look at those. They also have always had a training series for applicants where just showing the basic process as well. And then step-by-step -step videos on each form. Uh, the tutorials are um, not too long, five, seven minute videos showing each form or parts of each form and, and live demos of all of them. So for example, here today, I didn't show you full from beginning to end of the 471 and the 46 or anything. They do have their own videos out there that you can watch. So I definitely recommend using those. Um, and they also have PDF uh, user guides for men and instructions for many of the forms. So if you're the kind of person that likes to have in paper here in front of me, what I need to do with screenshots, while I'm doing the thing on the screen and, and matching those up, those would definitely be for you. So definitely look at those. Uh, the client service bureau I've been talking to you about throughout this session, uh, USAC's customer service, that's their 800 number, 888-203-8100. Also within Epic, the contact us link, there's where you can send an email type uh, request to them. And then lots of information, all those uh, and everything on the main USAC website. It's not just for logging in, it's for getting information about the E-Rate program. And of course, my contact information. As I said, I am your state E-Rate coordinator for public libraries. I am here to help you get through this process. I have spent over 10 years helping libraries, uh, holding hands, holding their hands, whatever needs to be done. Call, email me, reach out to me for anything, any questions you may have um, about doing your application. I just want to show you here also quickly, this is the E-Rate website that I have for on the Library Commission page, um, nebraska.gov slash E-Rate. Um, inf basic information about the program, uh, links to other information, links to the training, the USAC's training they did this fall, there are other videos and training um, information, uh, information about all the tools, the link to the Department of Education page for school and lunch program information, um, so I try to give links out to anything that may be of use to you about each step in the form. Also, the SIPA information I have here, uh, types of filters you can do, um, information about it. And then um, if you're interested in what has been done, in, here in Nebraska, we started having libraries apply and receive E-rate in as far back in 1998, the first year that could be received. And I have lists, we have lists here of every library and how much and what they've received it for. So if you're wondering where you are on here or where some of your colleagues may have applied, what they may have received, you'll find it on our lists here. All right, so that wraps it up for our workshop today. Um, does anybody have any last minute desperate questions you'd like to ask me about before we do um, end things? Type into your question section. Um, I know there's a lot of information to give, um, but I hopefully it was useful to you to at least go through the whole process. They said the recording will be available in a bit. <laughs> it's going to take some time to go through any editing that needs to be done, but you'll be able to rewatch it and look at anything else you might want to on the um, E-Rate website for more help. Oh, it doesn't look like anybody has any questions you want now. That's fine. Call email if you do and get out there and apply for your ERA and get your funding. Good luck. <laughs>